The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 0 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Published by the Baha'i Publishing Committee, New York Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. 1 Corinthians 4 5. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Matthew 16:27. He hath come with his most mighty power among the nations. Turn toward him, O concourse of the good. The Father hath come, and that which hath been promised unto you in the kingdom is accomplished. Baha'u'llah O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 22.29 Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Deuteronomy 32, 1-3 Hear, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place. Micah 1-2 Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Isaiah 1-2 is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Jeremiah 23.29 The anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. 2 Samuel 23.1 Man, the most noble and perfect of the creatures, is a mightier evidence and greater expression of truth than the other visible things. The most perfect, superior, and excellent of men are the manifestations of the Son of Truth. Baha'u'llah The Son of Truth is the Word of God, upon which depends the training of the people of the country of thought. It is the spirit of reality and the water of life. All things owe their existence to it. Its manifestation is ever according to the capacity and coloring of the mirror through which it may reflect. For example, its light, when cast on the mirrors of the wise, gives expression to wisdom. When reflected from the minds of artists, it produces manifestations of new and beautiful arts. When it shines through the minds of students, it reveals knowledge and unfolds mysteries. All things of the world arise through man and are manifest in him, through whom they find life and development, and man is dependent for his spiritual existence upon the Son of the Word of God. All the good names and lofty qualities are of the Word. The Word is the fire of God, which, glowing in the hearts of the people, burns away all things that are not of God. The minds of the lovers are ever aflame with this fire. Outwardly it is a burning fire but inwardly it is calm light. This is the water which giveth life to all things. We beg of God that we may partake of this life-giving water of heaven and quaff from the spiritual chalice of rest and thus be free from all that tends to withhold us from approaching his love. Glory be upon the people of glory. Words of Wisdom, Baha'u'llah. The Word of God is the storehouse of all good, all power, and all wisdom. The illiterate fishers and savage Arabs were thereby enabled to solve such problems as were puzzles to eminent learned men in all the ages. It awakens within us that brilliant intuition 
which makes us independent of all tuition and endows us with an all-embracing power of spiritual understanding. Many a soul in the arc of philosophy, after fruitless struggles, was drowned in the sea of conflicting theories of cause and effect, while those on board the craft of simplicity reached the shore of the universal cause by the aid of favorable winds blowing from the point of divine knowledge. When man is associated with that transcendent power emanating from the word of God, the tree of his being becomes so well rooted in the soil of assurance that it laughs at the violent hurricanes of skepticism which attempt its eradication. For this association of the part with the whole endows him with the whole, and this unison of the particular with the universal makes him all in all. Abdu'l-Bahá Introduction The claim of the Baha'i, glorious revelation, is that it is the word of God sent to men to remove the antagonism and differences between peoples of various religions and prepare the way for their coming together in harmony and love and in an assured knowledge of the will of God. It proclaims the time of universal peace and provides the foundation for the universal religion, the hope of the ages. It points the way and supplies the means for the unity of mankind in the knowledge and love of truth under the high banners of justice and mercy. It is simple, profound, purifying, searching, as is the word of God always. It is divine in origin, human in presentation, sane, practical, and applicable to life in its every phase. In belief, it inculcates naught but truth. In action, naught but good. In human relations, naught but loving service. A world religion is needed, a solvent of religious differences, an enlightener of religious misconceptions, an unifier of peoples in the knowledge of the one God and Father of them all, a platform on which all believers and seekers for God and His truth may meet, from whatever race or training they may come. And that religion must recognize the divine elements which underlie all religions and meet each loyal soul upon his own ground without claiming advantage over him, but rather bringing the light of God's word to shine upon the truths he already has, in order that he may develop into a higher understanding of truth itself. The honored scholar and noble man, Max Muller, who had frankly studied the languages and religions of the Orient, wrote as follows. The true religion of the future will be the fulfillment of all the religions of the past. The true religion of humanity, that which in the struggle of history remains as the indestructible portion of all the so-called religions of mankind. There never was a false god, nor was there ever a false religion, unless you call a child a false man. All religions, as far as I know them, had the same purpose. All were links in a chain which connects heaven and earth, and which is held and always was held by one and the same hand. All here on earth tends towards right, truth, and perfection. Nothing here on earth can ever be quite right, quite true, quite perfect. Not even Christianity, or what is now called Christianity, so long as it excludes other religions, instead of loving and embracing what is good in each. That true religion of the future, as Max Muller saw it, has already arrived in the Baha'i revelation. But where else is such a religion? With all the glorious efforts and results of Christian missionary enterprise during the recent decades, it has scarcely made an impress on Muslims, Zoroastrians, Buddhists, Brahmins, or Jews. It has endeavored to overthrow the religious conceptions of other nations in favor of its own, but it has taught the interpretations of its churches rather than the direct, simple teachings of Jesus, placing the word of man in lieu of the word of God, and therefore it has been powerless to win those peoples who believe that they have also received the divine word from their own prophets and founders. It is possible that the records of Jesus' words are quite imperfect, but even so they have brought comfort, hope, and satisfaction to myriads of human souls, 
and if only his pure teachings had been presented with their doctrines exemplified in the lives of the teachers the whole world might have received them and loved them but the peoples will not accept the teachings of a cult and its doctors as against their own cults and doctrines it is necessary for the conquering of the heart of the world that the word of jesus shall be renewed and confirmed by a fresh revelation of god's command one that comes with declared authority and proves its right and source by its vitalizing effect upon the lives of men there is no religion that has remained pure and undefiled and consequently there is none of them fitted or capable to cause the nations to abandon their own religion to accept it the known condition of the world's religions is such that not one of them can subdue or amalgamate the others time and efforts only emphasize this fact what then shall the word of god proclaimed through so many of his prophets and messengers be for naught or shall the promise of his appearing to the world with power and the consequent union happiness knowledge peace and prosperity of mankind be accomplished the precedent to universal peace which is the millennium promised in all scriptures is the conscious knowledge of the one god of his messenger and his message to men the bahai teaching is that god's word faileth not that it is accurate and reliable that the time of its promises is at hand and that his word now proclaimed to the whole world in baha'u'llah the glory of god is powerful and able to achieve his will in the regeneration and union of mankind it is not a new religion but religion renewed wherever it has proceeded it has produced the results foretold of the end of the age and also declared by itself it proclaims the imminence of god and his presence with humanity it penetrates men's hearts and shows them their need of god and the way to find satisfaction for that need it does remove religious differences and dispel religious rancor and doubt it does bring men into the heart knowledge and consciousness of the love of god and into loving unity with each other without regard to race or former religion it inculcates divine morals ethics and characteristics and brings man to higher conceptions of duty and life than have been his heritage from the churches of various creeds it speaks with authority demanding that man shall obey the word and naught but joy and uplifting is found in that obedience it calls on man to test its worth by living its ordinances and those laws prove to be the very wine of life it comes not to destroy but to fulfill again that which has been fulfilled before and to complete that which has not been completed in the past it offers itself as the truth of god to every earnest soul its followers are already numbered by the millions and are of all the great religious nations if it be truth wise is he who accepts it if not surely duty demands that it be tested and its fallacy proved lest men be led astray it is but just to say that it is a very live wire and he who touches it must be prepared to receive in himself a powerful current of its electricity the truth of any religion can be proved and confirmed only by the heart by testing its tenets in the life the bahai revelation is unshaken in the arena of intellect but powers of reasoning cannot make final decision concerning spiritual truth one may read or hear it for a lifetime may listen to opinions or express them endlessly but no judgment is just no opinion reliable except that of the personal living and decision of the heart it is not a matter of philosophical reasoning but a question of fact and facts are demonstrable only by experience abdul baha was asked what is the truth he replied truth is the word of god which gives life to humanity it restores sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf it makes eloquent those who are dumb and living beings out of dead beings it illuminates the world of the heart and soul it reduces to nothingness the iniquities of the neglectful and erring ones beauty perfection brilliancy and spirituality of this existence come from or through the word of god for all it is the supreme goal the greatest desire the cause of life light instruction 
the road to attain to this truth is the love of god when the light of the love of god is burning in the mirror of the heart that flame shows the way and guides to the kingdom of the word of god as to that which causes the growth of the love of god know that it is to turn oneself toward god end of section zero the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section one the glory of the lord hear o israel the lord our god is one lord and thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might and these words which i command thee this day shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates moses deuteronomy six four to nine it is related that a certain scribe asked of jesus which is the first commandment of all jesus answered him the first of all the commandments is hear o israel the lord our god is one lord and thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment and the second is like namely this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself there is none other commandment greater than these mark twelve twenty nine to thirty one the great commandment the first and greatest commandment that of love is recorded alike by moses and jesus but how shall it be obeyed love is attraction it cannot be forced or commanded it must be drawn forth by the lovable the will may direct love's attention toward an object but can never compel its action the desirability of the object the longing for nearness and union with it, these are the inspirers of love. How can man love God, the infinite, whom no one hath seen? No man can comprehend God or know him as he is. How can his whole being, heart, soul, mind, and strength be devoted to the love of the unknown, the unseen? With all his striving and searching, man cannot find out god he can manufacture a god of his imagination a creature of his superstition usually a magnified reflection of himself possessing both his good and bad qualities but the gods of man's making are not worth his love and devotion how then shall he obey the great commandment although some knowledge of the beloved is necessary for love does the keeping of the commandment require us to know him as he is in his essence his pre-existence in order to love him man loves many things but knows not the essence of anything at the most he perceives only some of the desirable qualities manifested and he loves either the qualities or because of them their unknown essences if it be some precious jewel he admires the brilliancy luster hardness beauty of the gem its revealed qualities if it be a flower it is the freshness the forms of petals and stamens the colors harmony and fragrance which attract him or if a human being the human qualities strength knowledge power and ability or weakness sweetness delicacy refinement and grace draw forth his love yet in no case does he comprehend the reality which is hidden beneath these evident and attractive displays they are veils of beauty hiding their parent essence while revealing some of its attributes if we cannot penetrate through the yellowness density and qualities of a piece of gold to know what gold is how shall we expect to sound the depths of firmaments the magnitudes of space or mysteries of littleness to find out god 
and know what God is. The commands of the Almighty are not set forth in vain. Although man cannot lift himself above himself to the heavens of knowledge of the Infinite One, God can reveal to him that information of his beauty which shall cause him to be in man's sight the one altogether lovely. He who has placed in us the power to perceive qualities and values discloses enough of his lovable characteristics to draw to himself all the love of our beings. In every atom he unfolds his attributes, in sun, star, and moon, in dawn, sunset, and night, in storm and shine, in crystal, flower, and animal, and above all in man, the microcosm, the index of existence. The whole apparent universe is a great creational book, a concourse of mirrors displaying his qualities. All mankind attempts to read this book, but what each finds depends on his point of view, which has been formed by previous training and environment. Even in reading a printed book, in listening to music, or in viewing a work of art, no two persons see alike. Their perceptions are according to their education. So with the book of creation. The ignorant see only the powers manifested in nature, and cringe before them, while the more advanced in knowledge appreciate order, beauty, wisdom, and other delightful values therein. In the spiritual childhood of man, he stands in wonder and awe before that book, staring at its pages, unable to interpret them aright, until he has learned how to read. Each step of life is the result of education. In the alphabet of living, man learns that all existence is subject to law. The universe displays order and harmony in every part. The suns and planets, each element and organization, in the mineral, vegetable, and animal worlds, all are governed by inflexible law. Nothing is exempt. Therefore, law is universal and expresses itself in various definite, reliable actions, severally called laws, such as those of attraction, vibration, inertia, construction, as in crystal, plant, and animal, laws of cycles, of ascent and descent, summer and winter, life and death, centripetal and centrifugal laws, etc. This one great law of the universe keeps everything in its place. It binds the particles of rock together. It causes things to fall toward the earth's center instead of flying off into space. It holds the suns, moons, and planets perfectly in their orbits. It causes like to seek like, and it produces harmony among all material things, so that each fulfills its purpose in existence. Whatever we may call it, cohesion, gravitation, motion or force, it is in reality the law of love. It is co-eternal with existence. It is the immanence of God, the expression of the Creator in creation. If this love of God is so manifest in the kingdoms of matter, how much more must it be toward his higher creature, man? The very lowest and most ignorant of men is far higher in the scale of existence than minerals, vegetables, or animals. If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? God is love, always was love, always will be love. He has always loved man. We cannot conceive of any time that God's love has not been shown to him. All nature says to man, God so loves you that he has made me to serve you and to provide for your needs. Lo, here I am, do with me as you will. Food and drink, clothing and shelter, flowers and colors, beauty, order, variety, harmony and unity, all things for the welfare and delight of man. If the generous Father so provides for material and mental needs, how much more must his providence care for the spiritual necessities? All things are related to other things in a fixed manner. Nothing is independent or self-subsistent, but all are under the overruling law 
which expresses itself in each according to its needs and for its highest development even the laws of decay and disintegration are for an evolution to higher uses as the rock must be ground to dust before its nobler values may appear in the rose and grape man sees these laws of physical life working and expressing in all below and around him even in his own body and mind he also perceives that knowledge enables him to grow in wisdom and power as the government of each kingdom is such that it promotes its best condition so must there not be laws for man which shall direct him to his highest possible destiny the same divine wisdom which cares for the lily and the grass of the field to bring them to their fullness of use and beauty must surely provide for the exaltation of humanity to its perfection and this is above and beyond the realm of ordinary human faculties there is a marked and vital difference between man and the kingdoms below him they are sinless knowing neither right nor wrong unconsciously living the laws of their existence which are expressed in them not to them these laws are expressed also in man and to him because he is the only being who has the power to oppose nature and to select among her laws which he will serve man is endowed with godlike qualities powers of discrimination and judgment perceptions of values of worth and unworth and a free will to decide between them he has eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and can choose either as he will these superior faculties make him an intelligent choosing responsible creature responsible to himself for his attainment or loss therefore the generous loving lawmaker offers to him a clear knowledge of the laws of progress towards his greatest good in order that man may perceive learn obey and become as it were a conscious partner with him in the attainment of a life eternal a nearness and intimacy with the divine wisdom and love which shall exalt him into the heavenly condition of oneness with god man is said to be the greatest representative of god and he is the book of creation because all the mysteries of being exist in him if he comes under the shadows of the true educator and is highly trained he becomes the essence of essences the light of lights the spirit of spirits he becomes the center of the divine appearances the source of spiritual qualities the rising place of heavenly lights and the receptacle of divine inspirations abdul baha some answered questions page 273 the great law which enables man to understand the way of life and to walk therein is the revealed word or expression on the human plane of the will of god for the welfare of man it is the book of books the law of laws which reveals to man the hidden facts of being and teaches him how to know and love god and also how to understand the lessons printed on the pages of the universe it appeals to his heart is studied and interpreted there because it is expressed in terms of life it comes forth from the arcana of the heavens as the highest manifestation of truth the greatest message to promote the advancement and happiness of man to guide and light him in the right path it is the word of god end of section one the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section two the word of god the doctrine of the logos the word appears throughout all scriptures and it is concretely stated in the first chapter of the gospel of saint john in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god all things were made by him through the word and without him was not anything made that was made in him the word was life and the life was the light of men and the light the word shineth in darkness of ignorance and the darkness comprehended it not and the word was made flesh and dwelt literally tabernacled or pitched his tent 
among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What was that glory but the manifested word of the will of God, shining forth in words of light and illustrated in the holy, selfless life of the perfect man, all aflame with the divine spirit of God. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he, the incarnate word, hath declared him. Man, made after his image, is the highest expression of God in the world of being. When the invisible word, the creative power of God, becomes revealed through a prepared man and is transmuted through him into the spoken or written word, it is incarnated, made flesh, and is visible to man because it has descended into his plane of existence. When the same hidden word enters into the one fitted to receive it and becomes the sole light and power of his life it is incarnate revealing itself through the temple of his body from which its glory radiates in every word and deed that body is the throne on which it is seated and from which its proclamations are given the human instrument of revelation being then identified with the word which is the manifested spirit of god is also called the word or manifestation because he is the personification of that word to mankind the spirit and the word mean the divine perfections that appeared in the reality of christ the holy reality of the word of god is in the condition of the pure fine and shining mirror the heat the light the image and likeness that is to say the perfections of the Son of Reality appear in it. That is why Christ says in the Gospel, The Father is in the Son. That is to say, the Son of Reality appears in the mirror. Abdu'l-Bahá, Some Answered Questions, page 240. Man is the word speaker. He is taught by words. He communicates his ideas, wishes and will by words. His accomplishments on earth result from his words. He trains the most subtle powers to carry his words to the end of the world. He records them on stone, wax, parchment and paper that future generations may not utterly forget him. All this is that man may understand God's method of communicating his will and may receive the teaching of his higher attributes by means of the uttered word. In order that it may reach man, it is revealed through human mouthpieces. God hath spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3.21, Luke 1.70 And when the time arrived for the coming to birth of the kingdom of God among men, the incarnate word was called his only begotten, his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 What wonderful, what beautiful teaching! God was not angry with mankind as some have taught. How could they teach so with these words flaming before their eyes? Was not the whole burden of Jesus' teaching love the love of the Father, and that man should love God and love man his neighbor? How could man love an angry God, a wrathful monarch? No, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the incarnate Word, that whosoever accepted him, believed in him, should have everlasting life. That representative of divine love, whose whole life was love, was not given to suffer anguish in the place of man, to be rejected, scorned, and crucified, to bear the deserved punishment of men's sins, and thus placate an offended father? Truly, he suffered all these things because of the sins of men, but it was through the wrath of man, not of God his Father. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world through him might be saved. 927, 317. He never condemned the poor, ignorant sinners, blind from their birth. He said to them, Go and sin no more, and in the very depth of degradation and suffering poured upon him, he cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His fatal and awful condemnations were only for the mighty, the learned, the false guides, the blind leaders of the blind, the priestly revilers of the word of God. It is related that the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, Luke 5.1, because man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Deuteronomy 8.3, Matthew 4.4, 4, Luke 4.4. 4. He said, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. What is meant by believing in him, if it be not to believe the word he spoke, the word of the Father poured forth from his blessed lips for the uplifting of men, and to bring all who believed in him into the kingdom of God, new-born, new creatures, sons of God, and heirs to the glorious bounties of the kingdom of heaven? To believe on him meant also to recognize him as the messenger and son of the Most High, and that belief followed the acceptance of his word. The word of God is the key to immortality. It is the bearer of eternal life. It is the instructor in knowledge of God, that man may know and love him, may become his son, be one with him as the iron with the magnet, and be heir to his kingdom, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 1.23 When the iron is in the fire, it loses its hard, black, cold qualities, being filled with the fire, it becomes soft, fluent, glowing and fiery. It can say, I am one with the fire, I in the fire, and the fire in me, I and the fire are one. Thus is man who is born of the Spirit. He is a new creature, transformed because transmuted by the elixir of the word, which changes the copper of his nature into the pure gold of another and loftier state known as eternal life or immortality, a condition of oneness with the Spirit of God and sonship to Him. This is the true image or likeness of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear we shall be like Him for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. This resurrection from a lower to a higher station, this new birth, rejoices the psalmist when he exclaims, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Psalm seventeen fifteen. This is immortality, not merely continued existence, even the Satans have that. But an eternal oneness with life itself, the true one, whom to know is life eternal. Jesus said, This is the will of my Father, that every one that beholdeth the Son, and believeth on him, should have eternal life. John 6.40 The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. John 6.63 such statements fill the New Testament and are in accord with the divine teachings of all time, namely, that the Word of God is the giver of light, the teacher and guide of men to eternal life, the creator of new hearts and right spirits, the revelation of God. In Genesis, the book of creation, it is written, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, the word, Let there be light, and there was light. It is the same story, 
not necessarily an account of the creation of physical light, but rather of the real creation which occurs to every man in whom a new heart is created and a right spirit renewed. He is dead in ignorance and chaos. Darkness is upon the face of his soul until the word of God enters into him and says, Be light. Then comes a dawning, an awakening, a dayspring, a resurrection within him. He is recreated, born again, begotten of the Spirit, a son of God. It is always accomplished by the word be, and it is. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Psalm 33, 6. His heavens are also created in the hearts of those who love and serve him. The kingdom of heaven is within you. This recognition of the word and perception of light is the first step man takes toward the divine destiny, the heavenly manhood, which God his Father has made possible for him, and to which he invites him in each one of his supreme commands. God is the Lord who hath showed us light. Psalm 118.27 The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, 130. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. Job 33, 29. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light. Revelation 21, 34. End of section 2. The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase. Section 3. The Gift of God. God loved the world, not only the Jews at Jerusalem, but all mankind. Not only at the time of Jesus, but before and since. Always, since the world began, he has given his word to all men at all times, in so far as they were able to receive it. Whence came the wonderful instructions for life in the ancient writings of Enoch, Moses, David and the Psalmists, in the Vedas, the Avesta, the Gathas and Upanishads, in Isaiah and Lao Tse? Were they of human or divine manufacture? They were always higher than the imaginations of men, and they were opposed to his natural desires. When their inner significances and realities are perceived, the oneness of their essentials is so evident that there can be no doubt that they originated from a single source. They all had their origins in the word of God, which in its essence is the same today, yesterday, and forever. There is but one God. His word is ever one and the same. That which is different is not his word. Each of the great religions bases its teaching, faith, loyalty, and existence upon confidence in the word of a single human founder. Each points back to him as the reliable one, the superlative one, the infallible one. But no word is infallible save that of God, and if those great ones were truly reliable, their word must have been the word of God. The expression of that word through such prepared human instruments has always been the method whereby man has learned the will of God for his own life. They were the mouths of the Lord. That the Almighty God chooses a man to be his representative and his mouthpiece is shown in the interesting account related in Exodus 3 and 4 of his appointment of Moses to be the deliverer of his people Israel. After God called him out of the burning bush and told him that he was the God of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said, I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God is always trying to bring his children out of the Egypt of darkness and ignorance. But Moses did not seek such an appointment. He dreaded it and tried to escape it, although he desired to serve God. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Then God gave his mighty name, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. 
he also gave further instructions to moses to tell the people how god had appeared unto him and given these commands and moses answered and said but behold they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice for they will say the lord hath not sent thee then the lord showed him how to manifest signs of power by the symbols of the rod and of the right hand but still moses said unto the lord o my lord i am not eloquent neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant but i am slow of speech and of a slow tongue and the lord said unto him who hath made man's mouth have not i the lord now therefore go and i will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say yet moses could not entirely sever his thought of self and trust the lord and he said o my lord send i pray thee by the hand of him whom thou should send how prone we are even to this day to decide in our minds whom the lord shall send as his representative to man and how he shall come but after all this god chose moses to be his representative to israel and even appointed aaron his brother to be a mouthpiece for moses saying i know that he can speak well and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and i will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do and he shall be thy spokesman unto the people and he shall be even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth and thou shalt be to him instead of god thus god puts his word into the mouths of his chosen ones and thus he appoints a man to be as god unto men it is by the might of the word that man is saved the power of god is in the word but it saves only him who takes it into his heart that it may spring up there into a fountain of living water from which he may be born into a new life in its lower outer aspect it is for the advantage of man's present living it teaches him morals and ethics which are the only source of all true ethical training but its deeper meanings and instructions are to prepare man for an inner life widely different and incomparable to this life indeed the best outer life is but death compared to this inner life it is an old life compared to a new life the speech of these mouthpieces of god was in the language and terminology of the time and place where it was given but the teachings were offered and accepted only up to the degree of capacity in their hearers in the ages of spiritual infancy man could receive but little of the strength of the word and its doctrine was according to his capacity first came the laws of fear and obedience then reverence justice wisdom and love were inculcated as man progressed in the schools of the prophets each revealer of the word was a heavenly schoolmaster and each divine lesson became the foundation for further teaching of a later day each manifester of the commands of god referred to the teachings of those before him as witness to his own authority for had ye believed moses ye would have believed me john 5:46 age after age through all history one has appeared who gave to man the word of god divine instruction how to live and what to do to attain a higher and heavenly station to overcome former conditions and rise to a manner of life which should be permanent sinless perfect and valuable with each one there was no earthly power no armies royalty riches nor honor but rather poverty apparent weakness oppression hatred and rejection whatever the circumstance time or place he was or became poor in all things except the riches of the word which ever went forth from the door of humility and lowliness it was simply delivered and left to itself without human aid except the life illustrating it that it might prove its divine power by its own penetrative creative and transforming effect upon mankind at first it entered the hearts of the few changed their lives opened their minds to the truth and love of god and then went on from generation to generation altering the destinies of nations overthrowing dynasties forming new peoples and giving life and hope 
to untold millions of souls throughout centuries of time. There are men in this day, reputed to be learned, who try to deny that the historical Jesus ever lived. The histories of him are hearsay accounts written by unknown authors. Not a word of his own writing is in existence as far as known. Indeed, there is no record that he ever wrote except with his finger upon the ground. What a wonderful symbol was that, if it be understood. Even as God wrote with his finger upon the tables of stone borne by Moses from Sinai, yet the evidence that the Christ lived in that age of the world and that he gave such teachings as are recorded is as certain as the existence of the sun because there must have been a speaker of the words which have lived and proved their divine quality through nineteen centuries in every way possible for the mind or heart of man to conceive none but a christ could have conceived such a character as the man christ jesus the proof of the sun is its shining and its effect on the physical world the evidence of the word of god is its educative power and the light of life which it kindles in the souls of men making each heart a living flame never to be quenched no one who has felt the elixir of the word penetrating his soul and the fountain of eternal youth springing up within him can ever deny the reality of the christ and the fact of human manifestation the bearer of the cup of life that which distinguishes man from the lower kingdoms that which makes him a man is the power of the word of god working in him to will and to do to create new methods of thinking and doing to implant new ideas which later become ideals toward which he strives because he perceives them to be more valuable than his former knowledge and possessions and so he grows from childhood to manhood grows in favor with god and man many can bear witness to the power of the word in their lives it enters through the brain into the mind of man and if not rejected it goes deeper penetrating his heart piercing through the shells of self-sufficiency and self-conceit and becomes the new motive power of his life for the word of god is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart hebrews four twelve sometimes the effect is sudden in the twinkling of an eye sometimes a great grief or disappointment is the cause of his awakening because such experiences drive man as it were to god for relief from despair he finds in time of sorrow and trial that there is no comforter but god and that consolation comes through the revealed word which always invites the hungry the thirsty the weary to water food and rest therefore the manifestation of the word is indeed the comforter sent by god to those who turn to him it teaches us of the realities of things what we are and what we may be it tells us of the destiny made possible to us by the love of our father it is so plain that no fairer in the way need err therein it is so full that infinite riches reward him who enters its depths it is the pearl of great price the treasure of mankind the guerdon of immortality the path of eternal life its rewards are love wisdom service bounty and joy the divine proof the permanent and reliable evidence of the mission and authority of any one of god's chosen manifestations is the effect of the word he speaks man's word is of little weight meaning or permanence it is only for the circumstance and time it soon fades and is forgotten but the word of god passes not away it changes the very nature of man it lives grows spreads in ever widening influence has depths and mountains of meanings is exhaustless boundless mighty and rides in triumph over innumerable graves and generations of the works of men so it is said in the revelation of saint john that he who went forth conquering and to conquer riding upon the white horse and followed by the hosts of heaven he who was the lord of hosts was called the word of god revelation 1911 is it not sufficiently evident that the great means for the salvation of men from themselves for the overcoming of all satanic desires 
and the attainment of eternal life is the word of God? All the mighty names surround the word, the one redeeming, creating, life-giving power, the angel of light, the king of righteousness, the son, the father, the manifestation, the glory of God, his right arm, his holy one, his redeemer and savior, is his word incarnate, revealed through the mouths and manifested in the lives of his holy and chosen ones from the beginning of the world. End of section three. The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase, section four. Succession of Divine Revelations. Back of all his revealers was the giver of the word, the infinite love, wisdom, and generosity. However man may have erred, misinterpreted, strayed, or opposed, God has never permitted the channel of communication to be entirely closed, lest man should be overwhelmed and destroyed in the floods of his own falsities. When the word became clouded by the false interpretations of ambitious men, veiled by their desires and errors, so that man was in danger of utter loss and denial of the holy word and its divine truth, when the waters of life became stained and adulterated by filtering through the brains of men, another one appeared and again proclaimed the word, calling on men to repent, to turn from the tales of their past, and look to the new sun of revelation, shining over the horizon of the world. This is history, not imagination. We know not what manner of men preceded the new spiritual cycle of revelation which appeared with Adam, but from that time prophet after prophet has proclaimed the will of God to this and that people. Whenever and wherever darkness has covered the earth and gross darkness the people, the glory of the Lord has arisen, bringing the dawn of a new dispensation of divine knowledge. The glory of the Lord is the revelation of his word, a shining sun of wisdom and love, a day dawn of enlightenment and assurance, dispersing the night of ignorance and doubt. Each of these great revealers of God's commands has declared that his dispensation was not final, has instructed his followers to look forward to another coming, to a great and glorious appearance whom all mankind would recognize, while the whole world should enter into a paradise of universal knowledge of the one God and worldwide peace in his kingdom on earth. It was declared that, at the time of the end, in the last day, there should be a revelation of God's will so clear that the hidden things should become known, so broad that all mankind should accept it. Many signs have been given in the sacred books and traditions, and they agree wonderfully, even in terminologies. In that day, the old heavens and earth should end like a scroll that is read and finished. A new heaven and earth appear, the sun should be darkened, the moon turned to blood, and the stars fall from heaven, because the citizens of that new city would have no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light, lamp, thereof. Revelation 21, 23. These signs were mentioned by Isaiah, Amos, Ezekiel, Joel, Jesus, Peter, and John, as well as by great prophets of other religions. Therefore their fulfillment was not completed in the time of Jesus, nor of the revelations of John. Prophecy is evidently of such a nature that it cannot be understood until after it is fulfilled, otherwise it would be mere foretelling. But when it is completed, its hidden meanings are disclosed, and easy to be comprehended by all who so desire. It was to be a time of trouble, of turmoil, disturbance and change, a passing away of old doctrines, thoughts and things, and the appearance of a new world of ideals and facts. The conditions of warfare, oppression, ignorance and suffering should finally cease, and a heavenly kingdom of wisdom, justice, mercy and love should ensue, accompanied by an earthly reign of knowledge, health, happiness, service, peace and prosperity. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Zechariah 14.9
for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, his manifested word, as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14, Isaiah 11.9. The Baha'i teaching is that when, in the ending of a great cycle of dispensations and the beginning of another, there is an universal manifestation of the will of God, the changes in all things are so great, the new conditions so advanced, that the old becomes forgotten and no trace of it remains. Although it is believed that man has existed on earth for immense periods of time, yet there is no record of him previous to Adam about 7,000 years ago. That was the time of the beginning of this great week of thousands of years now ending and passing in its turn into the leith of forgetfulness. Its Sabbath, its final day of peace and rest, has already dawned. The recurrence of cycles of spiritual light and darkness is as well established as the succession of days and nights. When the night of troubles and doubts becomes dense, when faith is dangerously shaken, another dawn of glorious revelation of God's word and will appears above the eastern horizon. This has been the history of mankind from the beginning and history is now repeating itself. Toward the end of the 18th century and in the 19th, the world was in deep spiritual darkness. We see the effects of that condition in the fierce greed of men and nations, their oppression over the weak, their craftiness, diplomacy, fear and reliance upon the God of force. In the schools we see the academic result in the widespread materialism, the scoffing at religion and spiritual ideas, the exaltation of man as against God, the dethronement of God from participation in the affairs of men, and the doctrines of man's self-sufficiency. Our great universities hesitate not to teach these doctrines of gross materialism, and their works on religion are often destructive rather than constructive. All these are the works of darkness, but God slumbers not, nor sleeps. Afar off in the Orient, his sun has risen with healing in his wings. His word has again appeared through Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. Even as darkness and ignorance have covered the earth, so this great light has shone forth with such brilliancy, power, and adaptation to the needs of all men, that it is already enlightening the globe, and seekers for truth, advancing ones from every clime and religion, from Persia, Russia, India, Egypt, China, Germany, France, England and America, are welcoming its beautiful and life-giving radiance. End of section 4 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 5 The Fullness of Time the times are full the days of prophecy are numbered and the prophecies themselves are being fulfilled before our eyes now is one of those remarkable periods of unrest of change from former to future conditions no plane of life is exempt be it material mental psychic or spiritual it is in the throes of a new creation a new conception, a disclosing of secrets and bringing forth of things new and old. We are already so employed in meeting the new wonders and adapting ourselves to the new environment that, with the exception of the workers in archaeological search, we care but little for the things of past centuries, which are rapidly fading from sight. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Isaiah 65, 17 Daniel indicated an hour upon the clock of time in the future history of the Persian kingdom, and Jesus referred his inquiring disciples to Daniel. The revelation of St. John pointed repeatedly to the same dial. Muhammad proclaimed the same period and all the scriptures of the world have declared in unison 
the events of that time of times. Now the fulfillment has arrived exactly on time. Those wise figurers, the Millerites, knew the date accurately and were prepared to meet it, but they misinterpreted the manner of its fulfillment and so grieved bitterly that God had not kept his appointment. They looked for a coming not in accord with known laws, forgetting that the laws of nature are the laws of God, and that he does not violate his own laws. The hour struck exactly at the appointed time, but it came quietly in the night, and did not sound an alarm of terror in the skies. As soon as its foreword was uttered in the Orient, the electric telegraph responded from the Occident and flashed its first-rate message to the world in the words, What hath God wrought? In its very year, the astronomers noted the disturbance of Uranus and cried, A new planet is near and about to be revealed. Two years later, Neptune was seen. In the same year, Turkey gave the great edict of toleration, permitting the Jews to reside in Palestine and allowing its subjects to become Christians. That was the beginning of the return of the Jews. In the mounds of Nineveh, that year, archaeology commenced to disclose the concealed mysteries of the past. All the world began to stir and awaken to the revealing of the hidden powers of earth, air, fire, and water. Men searched for realities, and, by the unrecognized light of the spirit, shining to assist every seeker for truth, they have discovered that which has amazed them. Though wonder piles on wonder, they are yet slow to acknowledge the real cause of this tremendous advance in knowledge. Sometimes, in the very act of discovering the marvelous bounties and benefits of God, they declare, there is no God. There is nothing so blinding to man as the pride of intellect, the exaltation of success. One may as well deny the influence of the sun in the growing of a tree as to ignore the power of the spirit, the divine light in the growth of scientific knowledge. To him who hath eyes to see, it is a necessity for the existence of man that, in this time of rapid and unique advancement in material knowledges, there must be an equal and balancing progress in spiritual enlightenment. Just in the degree that man recedes from the recognition of the actuality, presence, and authority of God as an overruling entity, and from the obedience to his revealed word, does he become the servant of greed, ambition, cruelty, injustice, oppression, and all that tends to degrade him and extinguish his real humanity. With the appearance of each invention, note how the hawks of the governments watch to test its adaptability to the purposes of war. The intent of the natural man is to rule or ruin, and power without the fear of God means ruin. These dangerous knowledges of means of destruction in the hands of godless rulers foretell the extinction of humanity within a few years unless the higher powers of spiritual knowledges, as expressed in the revelation of God's word, shall enter their minds and hearts and turn their desires to justice, mercy, and righteousness, to the love of God and man. This is necessary, not only for this nation and for that, but for all the peoples of the world. That knowledge which is possessed by one must be open to all, there must be a brotherhood of nations, not an autocracy of one over all. This is impossible while different religions separate and oppose them one to another. All must come into the acknowledgement of one God, one Spirit, one Truth, one Father, and the interdependence, unity, harmony, and brotherhood of all the members of the one human race. Then only can there be health and true prosperity in the great body politic of the world? End of section 5 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 6 As above, 
so below. All that is in the heavens and earth shows forth the divine names and attributes, until the traces of the splendor of that Sun of Truth are manifest and evident in every atom, so that, without the appearance of this splendor, nothing can be honored with this robe of life, nor attain to existence in the phenomenal world. What suns of knowledges are concealed in an atom? What oceans of wisdom are hidden in a drop? Among the beings man is especially assigned to these robes, and chosen for this dignity, for all the divine names and attributes are manifest and evident in human appearances in the most perfect and excellent manner. All of these names and attributes have reference to man. Everything glorifieth God and praiseth him. Some among them know God and mention him. Some mention him and do not know him. All things express the divine names and attributes. Each, in proportion to its capacity, indicates and points to the divine knowledge until the appearances of his attributes and names have encompassed all the seen and unseen. O thou, my friend, I declare in truth that if thou dost ponder over these statements, thou wilt find doors of divine wisdom and portals of infinite knowledge opened before thy face. Baha'u'llah The outward is the expression of the inward. The earth is the mirror of the kingdom. The material world corresponds to the spiritual world. Abdu'l-Baha, Some Answered Questions, page 319. The ancient hermetic proverb, as above, so below, signifies that every physical appearance and action is an outward shadow or reflection of a spiritual condition within or above it. This is a law well known from earliest ages. Whenever there are great changes in the material or mental worlds, they indicate corresponding movements in the inner and spiritual planes. The lower phenomena not only manifest the presence, influence, and laws of the higher conditions, but are also dependent upon them. The greatest material exemplar of the Spirit of God is light. If physical light greatly increases on the earth, as it has done in the last few years, it surely signifies an intensifying of spiritual light in the world of mankind. We have come out of the age of candlelight into the electric blaze, and it means more than the mere lighting of stores and streets. It is converting night into day, even as the night of ignorance and doubt in spiritual matters is beginning to disappear before the rays of the spiritual sun of revelation which has come to the world in this age. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Isaiah 9-2 Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 61 our x-ray discloses the interiors and contents of opaque substances. What a marvel! And how much greater the wonder when we learn that it typifies the penetrating power of the Spirit, which is now searching the hearts and reins of men in this day of resurrection and judgment as never before. The ships in need send silent messages into the air, even as we who pray send forth our supplications to the unseen, and answering succor comes to cheer and save. By telegraph and telephone we communicate with all the world and overcome all obstacles, little thinking that it means the leveling of mountains, the lifting of valleys, the making of the whole earth as a broad highway for the diffusion of knowledge, because it is the time when the glory of the Lord is revealed, and his word flashes like lightning from east to west and around the circle of the earth. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, 
and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together isaiah forty three to five what is that glory but the word of god by the aid of this electricity the physical servant of the spirit which furnishes light heat and motion annihilating space and time our ships and trains speed more and more swiftly lessening distances bearing the products of the whole earth to every part carrying travelers missionaries searchers for knowledge back and forth from nation to nation bringing all peoples into closer acquaintance making it possible for the gospel to be preached in all the world and fulfilling prophecy at the time of the end many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased daniel twelve four these things are evident to him who believes the word of god and seeks his truth but greater things are at the door how shall we interpret the dominion over the air which seems near at hand when it is accomplished the correspondence with spiritual flight and knowledge shall become clear and we shall know an uplifting and exaltation of which we now have little conception as we ascend from earthly attachments and soar in the atmosphere of the spirit we shall indeed meet the lord in the air the world is smaller today than yesterday and its interests are so commingled that all mankind is concerned in the news of today's happenings at every point of the globe commercial interests are so intertwined that a death in china a quarrel between the sheikhs in morocco or the arrest of a deserter in france affects all the money marts of the world within the hour the sensitive nerves of money now reach to the farthest corners of the earth has all this wonderful progress no deeper significance than commercial exploitation the word has gone forth from the throne of god commanding unity and peace and mankind is standing at the threshold of that millennium of spiritual knowledge and human harmony which has been promised through the ages all material processes bring men closer together all physical discoveries all mental energies are preparing the way for the great union and worldwide community of human interests when business shall be conducted in the name of the lord masters of industry think they are doing these things of themselves for the furtherance of their own little affairs and purposes knowing not that they are instruments in the hand of god to open the doors of opportunity to all peoples in this day of his revealing that no good thing shall be withheld from any and that the human race may enter into the consummation of peace on earth good will among men or as some of our friends interpret peace on earth among men of good will shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith isaiah ten fifteen in very deed for this cause have i made thee stand for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth exodus nine sixteen even the automobiles and electric cars declare the arrival of the day of his preparation the chariots shall be with flaming torches literally fire of steels in the day of his preparation the chariots shall rage in the streets they shall jostle one against another in the broad ways they shall seem like torches they shall run like the lightnings nahum two three end of section six the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section seven the golden age the discoveries of the last half century are sufficient to lift man from a condition of comparative childhood to a manhood of knowledge and the end is not yet looking back a few years within our own lifetimes we perceive that we were but children now we think we are wise but to him who sees beyond the present it is evident 
that whole universities of scientific and spiritual learning are opening their doors to us and that we as freshmen have just entered upon the vast course of knowledges which shall graduate mankind into an era of wisdom welfare harmony peace and prosperity such a golden age of godly and heavenly living as the world has never seen who now can smile at prophecy its literal fulfillments are crowding upon each other in this day of god's manifestation when he is revealing the hidden things of his treasuries and inviting every lover of truth to come and feast at the banquet of the lord who can say that his spirit is not working among men to perfect his promises when in one day the peoples of different religions in turkey suddenly forget their hatred and rush together in embraces feastings goodwill and joy these events followed the adoption of the constitution of turkey july twenty fourth nineteen o eight mohammedans christians and jews embrace each other regardless of religious differences in the streets of old jerusalem jews are seen holding aloft the green banner of mohammed while christians applaud and mohammedans open the doors of the great mosque on the site of the temple of solomon and welcome jews into that holy place where no israelite has been permitted on pain of death to stand for many centuries no longer is it necessary for them to wail against the outer wall of that sanctuary so sacred to them the door has been opened and whether or not it remains so it is a type of the opening of innumerable doors the removal of a multitude of barriers that have held apart the members of god's great family the human race never before has the world witnessed miracles like these although the prophets of old have declared them in language which cannot now be misunderstood the day of fulfillment is at hand is here the mouth of the lord hath spoken it isaiah 45 and every atom of existence proclaims it the subtle electric spark the particle of radium all the elements and powers of the four kingdoms earth fire air water and the spirit of man are arising from their lethargy to declare the vital presence of the spirit of god in overwhelming manifestation the old testament prophecies consist of two great burdens the condemnation dispersion and suffering of judah and israel and their forgiveness return and joyful gathering together in the holy land the real fulfillments of prophecy are on the spiritual plane but in order that even the blind may see there are literal fulfillments also today the jews are coming en masse to palestine they are not only filling jerusalem but are gathering in towns and villages and making efforts to buy the lands they are rapidly gaining precedence in business affairs and the wonderful changes under the turkish government seem to be opening the gates for a restoration of their honor and prosperity in the land of canaan the eleventh chapter of isaiah is one of hundreds of references to the present times some portion of its promises may be said to have been fulfilled by christ but only a portion and divine prophecy is of such nature that it calls for many fulfillments even to the time of final culmination all through it declares the occurrences of this day of revelation their presence and meaning are evident to the baha'i student one the coming forth of the rod the word the rod of iron to rule the nations the sharp sword of his mouth to smite the nations also revelation nineteen fifteen one sixteen two the appearance of the branch to manifest wisdom and knowledge and the spirit of the lord also jeremiah twenty three five to six three the changing of animosity into harmony and the dwelling together of different peoples in peace four the fullness and universality of the knowledge of the lord also habakkuk two fourteen five the ensign of glory standing for the seekers of truth and the assembling of israel judah and the gentiles also isaiah forty nine twenty two 
59.19 6. The coming together of the remnant of the Lord's people from all parts of the earth. 7. The cessation of envy and enmity against the Jews. 8. Their prosperity in the land of Canaan. 9. The laying under a ban the tongue of the Egyptian sea, smiting the river in its seven streams, so that men should go over dry shod. What is this river sea but the Nile, which has been put under bond by the great Aswan Dam and Highway, one of the engineering wonders of the age? Also Isaiah 62, 10-12. Think of the number of prophecies in one chapter alone, and all being fulfilled before our eyes today. Surely, in this time, the intelligent student of prophecy will find richer rewards than ever before, because the proofs of truth are in procession before him, and it is the time of understanding. Hitherto, the peoples of the world have had little acquaintance or knowledge of each other. Each nation, knowing only its own manners, customs, and ideas, could see little good in any other. The foreigner was regarded as an enemy to be feared or overcome. Indeed, the attitude of governments to this day is that of fear. Each new battleship is a signal for the adding of one or more to other fleets. The strong fear a comparative diminution of their strength, and the weak are in terror of the strong. But the time of awakening has come, and on every side are those who recognize the ignorance and foolishness of such a condition among the reasonable beings, and the volume of their voice is constantly swelling and demanding peace. This national antagonism is but an extension of the ancient condition when each man's hand was against every other. Then the scattered units joined into the larger individualizations of tribes and the tribes into nations. The first intent was self-protection, the second aggression. This has been the kindergarten age of man, an age which is now coming to its end. Man has been playing at living, in a sort of rough competitive game, striving for personal benefit without regard to the welfare of others. The result has been that where one gained, many have lost, and mankind as a whole received nothing. Now it is beginning to be perceived that the power of progress lies in unity. It is an age of syndicates and combinations on ever enlarging scales, not only between individuals, but between great firms and corporations, and even churches are uniting for greater power and usefulness. This centering of scattered forces, this uniting of competitors, is in direct fulfillment of promise and prophecy. It is the preparation for the unity of man and the reign of peace. Treaties are made between governments for offense and defense against enemies. When treaties shall exist between all nations for the conservation of benefits and for mutual helpfulness in the progress and good of all, then shall there be the universal peace and an advance in the whole world to higher, better, happier conditions. In a vague sort of way, the millennium has been expected to arrive at some possible future sometime. But it is already at the door. Now, in the amazing increase of knowledges, the breaking down of barriers of ignorance, the widening of commercial interests, the closer acquaintance of peoples, in brief, in the acknowledged need of unity, the first rays of that glorious dawn of human solidarity, universal welfare and prosperity are appearing above the horizon. The practical evidences of this progress are on every hand. The establishment of hospitals for scientific research, equipped with the best materials and finest brains, the uses of anesthetics, the war on the white plague, tuberculosis, the improved methods of treating the insane and prisoners, the use of better and safer building materials as steel and concrete, the training of farmers in agriculture, providing the means to make an acre multiply its productive value, and to clothe the arid plains with grain and fruits, the government weather prognostications, 
the forming of democratic constitutions in empires, the judgments by arbitration, the increase of general education and worldwide influence of the universities, which receive their recruits from all lands, and year by year are sending out armies of young men trained in modern knowledges, the forming of international clubs in these great schools in America and Europe, where student representatives of all peoples become acquainted and form bonds of friendship, these advances, and a multitude more, are all for the service of mankind, for his elevation to new conceptions and methods of living, and they all witness the presence and power of the Spirit of God. Only from a source that is higher than man can such a host of glories be inspired. We are entering upon a human period when the motives of man shall be reversed, when his purpose shall be to serve rather than to be served, to benefit others, to conserve the interest of the whole rather than of the individual self. Instead of oppression, greed, and selfishness, the motive powers of man shall be justice, helpfulness, and love. These are the elements of peace and prosperity, which are twin brothers born of man's true evolution. Man is emerging from barbarism into civilization, from childhood to manhood, from darkness to light. He is just now passing out of his period of adolescence, of little wisdom and callow pride, into a noble maturity of conscious strength, knowledge, and manly stability. A great cycle of past conditions is closing, and we stand upon the threshold of a new age which is beyond all our present conjectures in its values to man. In its reality, it is the manifestation of God, the glory of the Lord, revealing itself upon the plane of humanity. Proceeding and accompanying these confirmations of prophecy has appeared the essence and crown of all divine manifestation, the word of God incarnate. It shone forth at the time appointed, from the place declared, in the manner proclaimed, and witnessed to by history and prophecy in every age of the world. End of section 7 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 8. History. The Bab. In the city of Shiraz, Persia, on the evening of Jamal e Aval 5th, 1260 AH, the 1260th year of Mohammedan reckoning from the Hejira, which was May 23rd, 1844 AD, a young man afterward known as the Bob or Gate, began calling upon men to repent, to purify their lives, and to prepare to meet he whom God shall manifest, who was about to appear to fulfill the words of the prophets and to proclaim the word of God. His mission was that of an Elias, a John the Baptist proclaiming the coming of one mightier than him and calling upon men to prepare the way for that coming. The place and time of that declaration corresponded exactly with the prophecies in Israelitish, Christian, and Mohammedan scriptures and traditions. It was in the Persian kingdom, which was the especial field of Daniel's prophecies. It arose out of Mohammedanism, which power was distinctly foretold as to appear in that former great kingdom of Persia. It was in the Mohammedan year 1260, which corresponded to the time, times, and half a time, named to Daniel as the period of these wonders, to the time of the end, which same period is referred to in several ways in the revelation of St. John. It was exactly one thousand years from the disappearance of the twelfth Imam, the Imam Mahdi, who was to appear at the end of that time to usher in the second coming of Christ upon the earth. The date fulfillment was in accurate accord with many prophecies, and the accompanying signs answered so literally to numerous declarations in various scriptures that many men of intellect, as well as those who were learned only in heart knowledge, believed in the Bab. 
his doctrine spread rapidly through persia and inspired such spiritual zeal that it aroused the antagonism of the orthodox ulamas and doctors of religious law great oppression was incited by them which finally drove the babis to fight in self-defense of their property and lives the history of trials and sufferings battles and martyrdoms endurance and joy for their faith and love of truth is authentic and scarcely paralleled in all the world one who witnessed such martyrdoms wrote how many children have become fatherless how many fathers have become childless how many mothers have not dared through fear and dread to mourn over their slaughtered children many were the servants of god who at eve were in wealth and opulence and at dawn were beheld in the extreme of poverty and abasement there is no ground but hath been dyed with their blood and no air whereunto their groanings have not arisen and during these few years the arrows of affliction have rained down without intermission from the clouds of fate yet notwithstanding all these visitations and afflictions the fire of divine love is in such fashion kindled in their hearts that were they all to be hewn in pieces they would not forswear the love of the beloved of all the dwellers upon earth nay rather with their whole souls do they yearn and hope for what may befall them in the way of god a european witness mr usher said it was enough to be suspected of barbeism to be at once put to death no time was lost between apprehension and execution death was the only punishment known the headless bodies lay in the streets for days the terrified relatives fearing to give them burial and the dogs fought and growled over the corpses in the deserted thoroughfares for six years the bob taught and wrote his instructions known as the bayan revelation most of the time in prison often questioned by the ulamas beaten and bastinadoed and finally he was martyred in 1850 at the age of 30 in the public square of tabriz an eyewitness not a believer writes of him at that time the bob kept perfectly silent his pale and beautiful face surrounded by a black beard his white and delicate hands his figure and distinguished manner everything in his person and in his dress aroused the sympathy and compassion of the spectators he had characteristics truly great and noble and was a man of firm and settled convictions his moral character was high and he aimed in his teaching to bring all his countrymen into a community united by intellectual and moral ties professor ross of university college london wrote his wonderful life needs no comment if ever a life spoke for itself it is the bob's with its simplicity integrity and unswerving devotion to the truth that was born in him he felt the truth in him and in the proclamation of that truth he moved neither hand nor foot to spare himself but unflinchingly submitted to all manner of injustice and persecution and finally to an ignominious death his influence penetrated deeper than their curiosity and their minds it reached their hearts and inspired them with a spirit of self-sacrifice renunciation and devotion as remarkable and as admirable as his own end of section eight the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section nine baha'u'llah in eighteen fifty two to three 
nine years after the first declaration of the bab baha'u'llah then thirty-five years of age a native of the city of nur light in persia and an exile to baghdad in arabia began teaching and expounding religious doctrines in such a way that it attracted the hearts of many listeners especially the babis and caused bitter opposition from others as contention grew he quietly left baghdad and for two years remained alone in seclusion in the mountains of sarkalu his whereabouts unknown to all when he returned to baghdad the teaching was renewed and in eighteen sixty three a d nineteen years after the bab's proclamation he openly declared his mission as he whom god shall manifest for twelve successive days in the resvan or garden of the city at that time he and his followers now known as baha'is were removed to constantinople and soon after to adrianople where they remained until eighteen sixty eight a d when under pressure from enemies they were transported to the political prison of akka in syria akka is about twenty miles from nazareth the home of jesus and nine miles from mount carmel the scene of many scriptural events thus was the baha'i manifestation driven by its enemies into the holy land god's land of promise god moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform the purpose of this imprisonment was to exterminate the movement as it was supposed to be already extinguished in persia by the killing of all who were known to be affiliated with it akka was famous for its deadly malarial conditions and prisoners there were usually short-lived it was said that a bird attempting to fly over akka would drop dead all but a scattered and unknown few of the former babis in persia had been martyred there were seventy men women and children with baha'u'llah in that exile and so secretly were they removed to akka so close was the imprisonment there that for a long time none of the friends in persia or elsewhere knew what had become of them baha'u'llah was confined alone in the highest room in the prison tower and all of the others were herded together like cattle in a large room in the barracks below they were allowed no communication with persons outside they were subjected to extreme hunger vile food and water mud filth and disease typhoid fever and dysentery broke out among them and all but five were ill even some of their guards were sick one man only was left to care for them all that man was abbas effendi the son of baha'u'llah now known as abdul baha the servant of the glory of god in spite of the horror disease oppression and suffering these people lived to be released from close imprisonment after a long period and eventually they were allowed the freedom of the valley of akka reaching from akka to haifa nine miles away it was during this time of strictest confinement when each loaf of bread was cut open by the guards to see that it contained no communication that the long epistles letters to the kings were sent from that prison tower to the monarchs of the earth including the pope at rome queen victoria napoleon the third and the president of the united states calling upon them to recognize baha'u'llah as the messenger of god it was then when the cause seemed to human sight to be extinct and buried beyond possibility of resurrection that the most triumphant paeans of victory were penned to the exiled captive in his silent chamber in the prison tower of akka he proclaimed the triumph of the spirit of god over the whole earth as an accomplished fact 
the utter defeat and rout of the hosts of darkness and the victory of the glory of god baha'u'llah the word of god over the hearts of men throughout the world today millions of happy souls are rejoicing in that word devoting their lives to that cause and proving that the word was divine and from the almighty god and that the imprisoned man who suffered that the word might come to its birth and maturity among men was indeed the manifestation of the will of god for forty years baha'u'llah taught and wrote all of that time in exile and much of it in what he called the greatest prison his works are voluminous and all are filled with instructions of exalted wisdom for both the spiritual and material evolution of man they parallel the divine teachings of all past ages illumining and showing them forth in wonderful clearness and new beauty they meet the needs of the spiritually hungry in every religion and clime they penetrate the hearts and thrill the souls with divine aspiration and light they melt away all separateness in the fires of love and bring believers from every part of the world into a perfect unity professor edward g brown lecturer in persian to the university of cambridge england who visited baha'u'llah in 1890 said the face of him on whom i gazed i can never forget though i cannot describe it those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul power and authority sat on that ample brow while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet-black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance almost to the waist seemed to belie no need to ask in whose presence i stood as i bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain End of section 9 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 10 Abdul Baha Abbas Before his departure, in May 1892, Baha'u'llah appointed his son, Abbas Effendi, Abdul Baha, to be the center of the covenant of light, love, and peace which he had founded in the name of God. He commanded all to turn their faces to Abdul Baha for understanding, thus making him the authorized interpreter of his writings. The only claim that Abdul Baha makes for himself is this authority of interpretation, and that he is Abdul Baha, the servant of God in this revelation. Abdul Baha Abbas was born in Tehran, Persia, on the evening of May 23, 1844 A.D., at the very hour while the Bab was uttering in Shiraz his declaration of the fullness of the times and the coming of the Great Revealer. He was not of the family of the Bab, and the Bab could not have known his birth by any material means at nine years of age he accompanied his father in the journey of exile to baghdad and from that time he shared every hardship suffering and imprisonment ever manifesting such remarkable wisdom influence helpfulness and endurance that he was always called the master he proved his mastership in every emergency whether of contention oppression and persecution or in severest trials and sufferings professor brown says of his meeting the master in april eighteen ninety one more eloquent of speech more ready of argument more apt of illustration more intimately acquainted 
with the sacred books of the jews the christians and the mohammedans could i should think scarcely be found even amongst the eloquent ready and subtle race to which he belongs these qualities combined with a bearing at once majestic and genial made me cease to wonder at the influence and esteem which he enjoyed even beyond the circle of his father's followers about the greatness of this man and his power no one who had seen him could entertain a doubt the declaration of the bab and the birth of abbas effendi in different parts of the kingdom of persia simultaneously on may twenty third eighteen forty four were the forewords of the coming revelation the establishment of the new heaven the spiritual kingdom of god upon earth and the unity of mankind in the universal knowledge of one god and in the peace of obedience to his declared will the declaration of telegraphic success in the words what hath god wrought flashing out in america on the morning of may twenty fourth eighteen forty four was the material response and forward of the new earth to be created for the physical welfare of man in the millennial age about to appear the spiritual proclamation came from the east the material answered from the west that material prophecy has been followed by such a wealth of revealing of the hidden powers and gifts of nature that man is overwhelmed and amazed and cannot yet comprehend but a small portion of the values already discovered while he perceives a host of new wonders pressing upon him mr thomas a edison says scientific discoveries are coming so thick and fast there are so many of us working like beavers at them that it is appalling merely to think about possibilities in the future everything anything is possible the world is a vast storehouse of undiscovered energy the spiritual forwards were followed by such a spiritual resurrection and devotion as the world has not witnessed before tens of thousands of saints gladly joyfully suffering every indignity loss cruelty and finally martyrdom for their pure faith in the word of god and their love for him then came the great revelation baha'u'llah the glory of god opening the books of the past renewing the word of god calling all mankind to the table of the lord descending from the heaven and laying the foundations for the ascent of humanity into a glorious manhood of godly knowledge salvation and life and now the son and servant abdul baha is spreading that divine word to the farthest corners of the earth and the advancing ones the fearless lovers of truth those who long for nearness to god and obedience to his will are gathering to that standard of peace and love from every religion land and race glory be upon the people of glory end of section 10 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 11 a statement in the name of our lord baha'u'llah god is the one who inspireth the hearts of his servants with that which he willeth he is god i testify with my being and identity that verily he is god there is no god but him he hath ever been god and will be forevermore the one the self-subsistent the eternal and i testify that verily the blessed perfection his holiness baha'u'llah is no other than the most great manifestation 
magnified is his grandeur and glory who was promised in all the holy scriptures and that the most great mystery of god the branch extended from the ancient root who hath decorated his head with the crown of servitude and named himself abdul baha the servant of baha is the successor of the blessed perfection the center of his covenant and the aim of his testament and i testify that the hands of the cause of god bearers of his ordinances to the servants and preachers of his manifestation in the countries are the saints of god and his chosen ones by them the standard of the cause of god is raised and his signs are promulgated among the creatures they are the lamps of god for all in the heaven and upon earth upon them be the glory of god his praise and his mercy o ye our brothers who believe in god and in the books of all his religions know that all of us are unanimously believing in the ancient entity the eternal god that he is the creator of all things that verily he hath ever been and will continue to be forever we also believe that the prophets and the manifestations of god were all bearers of the message of god and that the holy scriptures are his books accordingly our belief and religion is that all the prophets are of necessity as one light one reality and as the rays of one sun even though they may appear to be different each from the other and each as a different person talking in a different tongue therefore all their laws and books must needs be as one law and one book even though some of the ordinances be in form contradictory to others because all of them have spoken on the part of god the one the unit and all the ordinances and laws are also revealed on his part this assertion is in no need of further rational proof now we submit that there are in the holy scriptures references concerning the most great manifestation and other predictions and signs regarding the end of the days these prophecies are recorded in various texts both chronological and symbolical all the nations have awaited the appearance of such signs and the coming manifestation of their promised one with earnest expectation yet to the present day the sun of their hopes has not appeared to them from the horizon of their expectation as to the honorable and faithful baha'is they believe that verily the promises and prophecies given in the holy scriptures have become fulfilled during the nineteenth century after christ by the appearance of the prince of the universe the most great baha'u'llah exalted is his glory this claim held by them is the best tidings to the expectant ones and a great joy to the seekers but only those can approve it who are endowed with a pure heart and fortified with the confirmation of god and who hearken with sincerity to perfect proofs to decisive and satisfactory arguments the bahai people is ready with all power and strength to prove its claim and to unfold the truth of its religion not through material force but by spiritual power not through the strength of this world but by that of the kingdom the bahais wage war with all the armies of the nations of the world not with swords and weapons but through the power of utterance and the enfoldment of the mysteries and meanings of the divine words they subdue the cities of hearts not with assaults of armies of men but rather by indisputable proofs by love compassion and affection their sword is the word of god their hosts the divine inspiration their ranks submissiveness humbleness meekness unselfishness and pure servitude in the presence of every soul 
of whatsoever religious nation and toward every being in existence their religion is to serve the people in the world their principle is obedience to government their teaching is summoning people unto god the true one their rewards and recompense come only from god they freely offer to people the bread of life and freely give them the water of life let him who hungers and thirsts partake freely of their table verily the doors of heaven are opened by the keys of the knowledge of his holiness baha'u'llah the paradise of enlightenment is decorated the rivers of inner significances are flowing the birds of sacred mysteries are soaring around and the spiritual foods are prepared blessed are they who eat blessed are they who drink end of section 11 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 12 teachings baha'u'llah made the utmost efforts to educate his people and incite them to morality the acquisition of the sciences and arts of all countries kindly dealing with all the nations of the earth desire for the welfare of all peoples sociability concord obedience submissiveness instruction of children of both sexes equally production of what is needful for the human race and inauguration of true happiness for mankind traveler's narrative page 69 baha'u'llah's declaration these teachings are translations from persian and arabic which are very difficult because of the wide differences between orient and occident not only in idioms and forms of expression but in methods of thought they also relate to the loftiest conceptions of divine subjects and are for earnest consideration rather than mere reading but they will be understood by those who study them with the heart i was asleep on my couch the breaths of my lord the merciful passed over me and awakened me from my sleep and commanded me to proclaim between earth and heaven this was not on my part but on his part and to this bear witness the denizens of the realms of his power and his kingdom and the dwellers in the cities of his glory and himself the truth i am not impatient of calamities in his way nor of afflictions for his love and at his good pleasure god hath made afflictions as a morning shower to his green pasture and as a wick for his lamp whereby heaven and earth are illumined the gales of the all-knowing the all-glorious passed by me and taught me the knowledge of what hath been this thing is not from me but from one who is mighty and all-knowing he bade me proclaim between the earth and heaven and for this hath there befallen me that whereat the eyes of those who know overflow with tears i have not studied these sciences which men possess nor have i entered the colleges inquire of the city wherein i was that thou mayest be assured that i am not of those who speak falsely this is a leaf which the breezes of the will of thy lord the mighty the extolled have stirred can it be still when the rushing winds blow no by the lord of the names and attributes rather do they move it as they list for being belongeth not to non-entity in the presence of the eternal his decisive command did come causing me to speak for his celebration amid the worlds verily i was not save as one dead in the presence of his command the hand of thy lord the merciful 
turning me. Can any one speak on his own part that for which all men, whether high or low, will contradict him? No, by him who taught the pen eternal mysteries, save him who is strengthened by the mighty and strong one. Tablet to the King of Persia Glory be to thee, O God! Thou knowest that my heart is melted about thy matter, that my blood boils in my veins with the fire of thy love, and that every drop thereof crieth unto thee with dumb eloquence, saying, O Lord Most High, shed me on the earth in thy way, that there may grow from it what thou desirest in thy books, but hast concealed from thy servants, save such as have drunk from the fountain of knowledge, from the hands of thy grace, and the stream of wisdom, from the cup of thy bounty. Thou knowest, O God, that in every action I desire nothing save thy affairs, and that in every utterance I seek naught but thy celebration. Neither doth my pen move, except I desire therein thy good pleasure, and the setting forth of what thou hast enjoined upon me by thy authority. Thou seest me, O God, confounded in thine earth. If I tell what thou hast enjoined on me, thy creatures turn against me. If I forsake what thou hast enjoined on me for thy part, I should be deserving of the scourges of thy wrath, and far removed from the gardens of nearness to thee. No, by thy glory, I advance toward thy good pleasure, turning aside from what the souls of thy servants desire, accepting what is with thee, and forsaking what would remove me afar off from the retreats of nearness to thee and the heights of thy glory. By thy glory, for thy love I flinch not from aught, and for thy good pleasure I fear not all the afflictions in the world. This is but through thy strength and thy might, thy grace and thy favor, not because I am deserving thereof. Tablet to King of Persia Words of Baha'u'llah When a seeker intends to turn the step of search and journeying into the path of the knowledge of the King of Pre-existence, he must first cleanse and purify his heart, which is the place of the appearance and emanation of the hidden mysteries of divinity from all the gloomy dusts of acquired learnings and from the illusions of satanic appearances and he must cleanse and refine his breast which is the throne for the accession and establishment of the love of the eternal beloved he must likewise sanctify his heart from attachment to water and clay, that is, from all phantasmal forms and spectral images, in such manner that no trace of love or hatred may remain in the heart, lest that love may cause him to incline toward a direction without guidance, or that hatred prevent him from another direction just as in this day most are bereft of the immortal face and of the threshold of meanings because of these two tendencies and are grazing shepherdless in the deserts of error and oblivion he should at all times trust in god and turn away from the creatures be severed and detached from the world of dust and united with the Lord of Lords, not preferring his own self before any one, but cleansing the tablet of the heart from pride 
and vainglory, attaching the heart to patience and self-restraint, observing silence and avoiding useless speech, for the tongue is a smoldering fire and loquacity is a deadly poison. Material fire devours bodies, but the fire of the tongue consumes souls and minds. The effect of the former vanishes in an hour, but the latter continues for a century. Egon 137-138 O oh people of Baha! Ye are dawning places of the love and day-springs of the favor of God. Defile not the tongues with cursing and execrating anyone, and guard your eyes from that which is not worthy. Show forth that which ye possess. Be not the cause of sorrow to anyone, how much less of sedition and strife. Ishragot 38 he should consider backbiting as error and never step into that court for backbiting extinguishes the brilliant light of the heart and numbs the life of the soul he should be content with little and free from avarice profiting by the companionship of the severed ones and regarding seclusion from haughty and worldly people as a benefit. At dawn he should be engaged in commemorations, seeking for that beloved one with the utmost earnestness and power, consuming heedlessness with the fire of love and praise, passing over all else save God with the swiftness of lightning, bestowing a portion upon the destitute and not refusing benevolence and favor to the unfortunate he should show kindness to the animals how much more to mankind and especially to the people of the revelation refusing not his life for the beloved and turning not away from the true one when reproached by the creatures he should not wish for others what he doth not wish for himself nor say that which he will not fulfill, keeping aloof from evildoers with all determination and asking the forgiveness of God in their behalf, condoning the sinners and despising them not, for the end is not known. In brief, the traveler and seeker should consider all else save God mortal and account all but the adored one as nothing. Egon, pages 138 to 139. This day is the day of God. God alone is speaking in it, and none should be mentioned but Him. Where are purified eyes of clear insight? Where are the withdrawn and illumined hearts? This day is the day of eyes, ears, and hearts. Beseech God that ye may possess these three, that ye may be withdrawn from the veils and sanctified, because a thin veil, the thinnest, may prevent the eyes from seeing, the ears from hearing, and the heart from understanding. Ponder carefully on this supreme word which was revealed previously by the supreme pen. O children of knowledge, the physical eye will be prevented from seeing the world and what is in it by a very thin lid. Then what will be the result if the veil of avarice cover the eye of the heart? Blessing be upon the soul who hasten to the ocean of the mercy of his Lord the ear which heard the cry of the supreme pen the eye which saw his wonderful verses and the tongue which pronounced his most beautiful praise shouldst thou turn thy face toward all the things of this world 
and listen with a spiritual ear, thou wilt hear them exclaim, The Ancient hath come, the Lord of the Most Great Glory hath appeared. When the lamp of search, effort, longing, fervor, love, rapture, attraction, and devotion is enkindled in the heart, and the breeze of love blows from the direction of unity, the darkness of error, doubt, and uncertainty will be dispelled, and the lights of knowledge and assurance will encompass all the pillars of existence. Then the ideal herald will dawn as the true morn from the divine city with spiritual glad tidings, and awaken the heart, soul, and spirit from the sleep of negligence with the trumpet of knowledge. Then the favors and confirmations of the eternal Holy Spirit will impart such a new life that one will find himself the possessor of a new eye, a new ear, a new heart, and a new mind, and will direct his attention to the clear, universal signs and to the hidden, individual secrets. With the new eye of God, he will see a door open in every atom for attainment to the stations of positive knowledge, certain truth, and evident light, and will perceive in all things the mysteries of the splendor of oneness, and the traces of the manifestation of eternity. Every atom and object will direct him to the beloved and to the desired one. He will become so discerning that he will distinguish truth from falsehood as the sun from shadow. Iqan 139, 140. If anyone with a pure heart and clear intelligence thinks about that which hath been revealed from the supreme pen, he will at once say with the tongue of honesty that now the truth is evident. Beware lest the matters of this world prevent thee from coming to the owner of names. By the life of God, that which is upon the earth shall vanish, and naught else remain save what hath been revealed from the heaven of the will of thy Lord, the Precious. Tablet By him who caused all else to pronounce the praise of himself, the world and what is seen therein, to the one who hath clear insight, will never be equal to one word of the words of God, because the former is forever and ever transitory and evanescent. But the word of God is eternal and everlasting, as is the eternity of the names and attributes. By the sun of the horizon, if all the world were of gold and silver, the soul which is really growing in the kingdom of faith will never turn toward it. If any one findeth the sweetness of that which hath been mentioned, then he will not act against the ordinances of God, and will turn to nothing but God. Also, he will see with a clear insight the evanescence of the material world, and his heart will adhere to the everlasting kingdom. God manifested himself to teach the people truth, sincerity, religion, faith, submission, reconciliation, compassion, courtesy, prudence, and piety, and to adorn themselves with the garments of good qualities and holy deeds. Say, O people, be merciful and do not desecrate the holy ordinances of God with your impure suppositions, evil thoughts, and delusions. We ask God to lead all people to the truth, to assist them 
that they may return to him and to strengthen them to serve his cause to spread his words and to act according to the ordinances of their ancient master end of section 12 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 13 the word of god hearken unto the exhortations of the unique friend with the ear of the soul o people of god the word of god is like unto a tree its planting ground must be the hearts of the people cultivate it through the river of wisdom and utterance so that its roots may become firm and its branches surpass the firmament tablet of the world 34 hearken to the voice of the compassionate counselor which is raised without veil or covering before the faces of kings and subjects and invite all the people of the world to the lord of pre-existence this is that word from the horizon of which the orb of grace is shining and gleaming tarozot 16 the world hath been kindled by the word of thy lord the shining splendor it is softer than the east wind and hath appeared in the form of man and by it god hath quickened his advancing servants in the inner part of this word there is a water whereby god hath purified the hearts of those who came unto him and who were negligent in mentioning aught else save him and thus he brought them nigh to the outlook of his great name we have caused the water to descend upon the dead and they arose looking toward the shining and brilliant beauty of god the heart of the world is aglow with the word of god it is pitiable should ye not avail yourselves of this warmth tablet the word which the most faithful god wrote hath appeared it hath indeed descended into the form of man in this time blessed is the lord who is the father he hath come with his most mighty power among the nations turn toward him o concourse of the good the father hath come and that which hath been promised unto you in the kingdom is accomplished this is a word which was concealed behind the veil of might and when the promised time came it shone forth from the horizon of the divine will with manifest signs consider how great is the value and how paramount the importance of the verses the word in which god hath completed his perfect argument consummate proof dominant power and penetrating will in the declaration of his proof that king of unity hath not conjoined anything with them for among proofs and evidences verses are like unto the sun while all others are as stars to the people they are everlasting proof fixed argument and shining light from the presence of that ideal king no excellence equals them and nothing precedes them they are the treasury of divine pearls and the depository of the mysteries of unity they are the strong thread the firm rope the most secure handle and inextinguishable light through them flows the river of the divine knowledges and bursts the fire of the consummate wisdom of the eternal 
This is a fire from which two effects proceed at the same time. It creates the heat of love within the people of faith and produces the cold of heedlessness within the people of hatred. O oh friend, we must not depart from the command of God, but acquiesce and submit to that which he hath appointed to be his proof. Iqon 146-147 Verily, the Spirit of Truth hath come to guide you into all truth. Verily, he speaketh not unto you from himself, nay, but rather from before the all-knowing and wise. Say, he is the one whom the Son hath glorified, and hath upraised his command. Abandon that which is before you, O people of the earth, and take that which is commanded you from before the powerful, the faithful. Purify your ears and turn your minds to hear the sweet call which hath arisen from the direction of Sinai, the abode of your most glorious Lord. Verily, he attracts you unto a station wherein you will behold the lights of the face, which hath shone forth from the brilliant horizon. Say, verily, he hath surely shone forth from the direction of the Orient, and his signs have appeared in the Occident. Think thereupon, O people, and be not like unto those who neglected the remembrance when he came unto them from before the mighty, the laudable. Awake by the breezes of God. Verily, they have blown in the world. Blessing to whosoever hath found their fragrance and is of the assured. Blessed is whosoever is illumined by the sun of my word. Blessed is whosoever adorned his head with the wreath of my love. Blessed is he who was assured in my word and stood up among the dead for my remembrance. Blessed is he who cut himself from all others than me, and soared in the ether of my love, entered my kingdom, and perceived the dominions of my might, drank the Kauthar, fountain of my favor, and the Salsabil, stream of my grace, was appraised of my command, and of whatsoever was hidden, in the treasuries of my words, and shone forth from the horizon of inner significances in my commemoration and my praise. Verily, he is of mine. May my mercy, grace, favor, and glory be upon him. Lohul Akdas The Supreme Pen Praise be to God, the True One, exalted is his glory, hath opened the doors of the minds and souls through the key of the supreme pen. Every one of the revealed verses is a manifest door to the appearance of spiritual virtues and holy deeds. Tablet of the World, 27 through the motion of the supreme pen a new life of significances is breathed into the body of words by the command of the ideal commander and the effects thereof are visible and manifest in all the things of the world tablet of the world 23 the supreme pen is that pen from the treasury of which the gems of wisdom and utterance and the arts of all the world have appeared and become manifest. Ishraqat 11 We exhort them to equity, 
justice trustworthiness and honesty and to that by reason of which the word of god as well as their own stations shall be exalted among men and i am the one who adviseth in truth whereunto testifieth he from whose pen the running water of mercy and from whose utterance the fountain of life hath flowed for the people of the world exalted is this most great bounty and glorious is this manifest gift words of paradise 65 the day of revealing this is the day wherein the speaker of the mount is established upon the throne of manifestation and the people have resurrected before god the lord of the creatures this is the day wherein the earth hath revealed her news and uncovered her treasures the seas their pearls the tree its fruits the sun its effulgence the moons their lights the heaven its stars the hour its tokens the resurrection its majesty the pens their traces and the spirits their arcana blessed is whosoever knoweth him ishraqat eleven shouldst thou make the mirror of the heart pure and clear from the dust of prejudice thou wilt comprehend all the symbols in the sayings of the perfect word of divinity in every manifestation and be informed of the mysteries of knowledge but unless thou destroyest with the fire of severance the veils of learning which are conventional among the servants thou wilt not attain to the brilliant morn of the ideal knowledge Econ 49 in this day a great banquet is celebrated in the supreme concourse for all that was promised in the divine books hath appeared this is the day of the most great rejoicing all must direct themselves to the court of nearness with the utmost joy happiness exaltation and gladness and deliver themselves from the fire of remoteness words of paradise sixty joy unto him who in this day casts away that which is possessed by the people and holds fast to that which is commanded on the part of god the king of names and the creator of things words of paradise 72 if the spiritual and divine eye of man be opened he will see that nothing exists without the appearance of the splendor of that ideal king for thou dost perceive that all contingent and created things express the manifestation and emanation of that ideal light and dost behold the doors of the divine resvan paradise opened in all things for seekers to enter the cities of intelligence and wisdom and attained ones to pass into the gardens of knowledge and power in every garden the bride of significances is seen seated in the chambers of words with full adornment and grace econ ninety nine end of section thirteen the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section fourteen declaration of god's singleness god singly and alone abideth in his own place which is holy above space and time mention and utterance sign 
description and definition height and depth traveler's narrative 148 we bear witness that there is no god but him everlastingly he was and there was nothing beside him everlastingly he will be even as he hath been exalted is the merciful one above this that the hearts of the people of wisdom should ascend unto the comprehension of his nature or that the understanding of such as inhabit the worlds should rise to the knowledge of his essence holy is he above the knowledge of all save himself and exempt is he from the comprehension of what is beside him verily in eternity of eternities was he independent of the worlds traveler's narrative 397 it is evident to the possessors of knowledge and illumined minds that the unseen divinity and essence of oneness hath been holy beyond emanation and appearance ascent and descent ingress and egress is exalted above the praise of every praiser and the comprehension of every comprehender he hath been and is everlastingly hidden in his own essence and will be eternally concealed from eyes and sights in his own entity the sight comprehendeth him not but he comprehendeth the sight he is the gracious the wise Egon 69 god in his essence is sanctified above ascent or descent entrance or exit he hath been and will be everlastingly independent of or free from the attributes of the creatures no one hath known him and no soul hath found out his substance all the sages are bewildered in the valley of his knowledge and all the saints are perplexed in their endeavor to comprehend his essence he is purified from being comprehended by all men of comprehension and is exalted above the knowing of men of knowledge persian seven valleys twenty nine the true one is sanctified above all but his signs are manifest in all things the signs are from him not he himself and all of them are recorded and visible in the volume of the world the plan of the world is a great book everyone endowed with perception can grasp therefrom that which shall enable him to attain to the right path and the great message consider the rays of the sun its lights have encompassed the world but these splendors are from it and from its manifestations they are through itself but are not itself i e its essence or substance whatever is seen on the earth is expressive of his power knowledge and grace while he god is sanctified from all his holiness christ says thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes words of paradise 46 declaration of god's manifestations all my limbs testify that there is no god but him and that those whom he quickened with the truth and sent for men's guidance are the manifestations of his most comely names the day springs of his supreme attributes and the recipients 
of his revelation in the realm of creation by whom the standard of the faith of the unity is set up and the sign of renunciation becomes apparent and by whom every soul taketh a course towards the lord of the throne traveler's narrative 397 man the most noble and perfect of the creatures is a mightier evidence and greater expression than the other visible things the most perfect superior and excellent of men are the manifestations of the sun of truth these holy temples are the eternal primal mirrors which express the invisible of the invisibles and all his names and attributes such as knowledge power dominion grandeur mercy wisdom glory generosity and beneficence Egon 72 I testify O my God that this is a day wherein thy proof hath been completed and thy evidence became manifest thy signs have descended thy tokens have shone forth thy face hath gleamed thy argument been perfected thy mercy hath preceded the beings and the sun of thy bounty hath shone in such wise that thou hast made known the manifestation of thyself the treasury of thy science and the dayspring of thy greatness and might he is the one whose covenant thou hast administered to whosoever is created in the kingdoms of heaven and earth in the realms of command and creation i testify that by him the supreme pen hath moved by his mention the tablets have been adorned in the kingdom of names by him thy breezes have spread and the fragrances of thy garment have been diffused between the earth and heaven tablet i testify that verily there is no god save him and he who hath come is verily the hidden mystery the concealed secret the most great book for the nations and the heaven of beneficence to the world he is the mighty sign among mankind and the dawning place of highest attributes in the world of emanation through him hath appeared that which was concealed from all eternity and was hidden from men of discernment verily he is the one whose manifestation was announced by the books of god in former and later times whoever acknowledges him his signs and his evidences hath verily acknowledged that which the tongue of grandeur hath uttered before the creation of heaven and earth and before the appearance of the kingdom of names through him the sea of knowledge hath moved among mankind and the running water of wisdom hath flowed from the presence of god the king of days blessed is the discerning one who witnessed and perceived the hearing one who heard his sweet voice and the hand that took hold of the book through the power of its lord the king of this world and of the world to come words of paradise 70 the true one glorious is his glory for the showing forth of the gems of ideals from the mine of man hath in every age sent a trusted one the primary foundation for the faith of god and the religion of god is this that they should not make diverse sects and various paths 
the cause and reason of hatred. These principles and laws and firm, sure paths appear from one dawning place and shine from one day spring, and these diversities were out of regard for the requirements of the time, season, ages, and epochs. We have sent one whom we have strengthened with the Holy Spirit, that he may give you glad tidings of this light, which hath shone forth from the horizon of the will of your Lord, the exalted, the most glorious, and whose effects have appeared also in the West, that ye may turn unto him in this day which God hath made the choicest of the days, wherein the merciful hath revealed himself to whosoever is in the heavens and earth. The fragrances of the merciful have diffused their sweet odors over the beings. Blessed is he who findeth their perfume, and advanceth unto them with a clean heart. Adorn thy temple with the embroidered garment of my name, thy tongue with my celebration, and thy heart with my love, the precious, the powerful. We have not desired for thee aught save that which is better for thee than all thou hast in thine own possession and what is in the whole treasury of the earth. Verily, thy Lord is the all-wise, the all-knowing. Behold, this is the sun of the cause which hath shone from the horizon thereof. Blessed is God, who hath appeared with the truth in manifest dominion. Tablet Do ye object to the one who hath produced unto you the evidences of God, his proofs, arguments, and signs? They are not of his own accord, but from the presence of him who hath delegated and sent him with the truth, and made him the lamp of the world. If my offense is caused by the exaltation of the word of God and the manifestation of his command, verily will I be willing to be the first of culprits, and will never consent to exchange this guilt even for the possessions of the kingdoms of the earth and heavens. Among mankind are some who say that this servant desireth not save the perpetuation of his name, and others say that he desireth the world for himself, notwithstanding that I have not found during the days of my life a place of safety, such that I might set my feet therein, but was ever overwhelmed in the floods of affliction, whereof none is aware save God. Verily he knoweth what I say. Doth he? who regardeth not his life as assured for less than a moment, desire the world? I marvel at those who speak after their lusts and wander madly in the desert of passion and desire. Shouldst thou drink the pure wine of life from the cups of the words of thy Lord the Merciful, thou shalt attain to a station whereby thou wilt cut thyself from that which thou hast, and cry in my name among the inhabitants of the world. Wash thyself with the water of devotion for the sake of this celebration, which hath shone forth from the horizon of creation. Verily, it shall purify thee from the dust of the world. Tablet to Napoleon the Third. Consider reflect on those people of old who cast the signs of god behind their backs and pronounce sentence with evident injustice against the manifestations of the command how many learned ones lamented at their separation and were expecting and supplicating day and night to be honored by a manifestation 
of a name of the names. But when the Creator of Heaven came, they turned away from Him and denied as falsehood the argument of God and His evidence, and practiced oppression against Him, whereat the eyes of the messengers have overflowed with tears. As to thee, grieve not for anything, and be resigned to God in all aspects. Verily, he heareth and seeth, and he is the listener, the answerer. Tablet End of section 14 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 15 The Purpose of Manifestation We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations, that all nations shall become one in faith, and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men shall be strengthened, that diversity of religion shall cease, and differences of race be annulled. So it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. These strifes, and this bloodshed and discord must cease, and all men be as one kindred and one family. Traveler's Narrative It hath been our aim to uplift men through exalted words unto the supreme horizon, and prepare them to hearken unto that which conduces to the sanctifying and purifying the people of the world from the strife and discord which results from differences in religions or sects, whereunto my heart and my pen, my manifest and my hidden being bear witness. God willing, they all will turn unto the treasuries which are deposited within themselves. Words of Paradise, 58. O beloved, in this day the door of heaven is opened by the key of the godly name. The ocean of generosity is manifested and is rolling before your faces, and the sun of providence is shining and gleaming. Do not exclude yourselves. Do not destroy your most precious time through the speech of this or that person. Confirm the back of energy and do your best in training the people of the world. Do not consider that the cause of God is a cause of opposition, hatred, and wrath. The tongue of greatness saith that what is intended by that which is revealed from the heaven of will in this holy, supreme manifestation is to unite the people with love and friendship toward all. The people of Baha who have drunk of the pure wine of reality must associate with all the world with the perfect spirit of joy and fragrance, and remind them of that which is for the benefit of all. This is the commandment of the wronged one to his saints and sincere ones. O people of the earth, make not the religion of God a cause for variance among you. Verily, of a truth, it was revealed for the purpose of unifying the whole world. Fear God, and be not of the ignorant. Blessed is he who loves the world simply for the sake of the face of his generous Lord. We did not come except for the purpose of uniting whosoever is upon the earth and bringing them into perfect harmony and agreement. Tablet Look on the world as a temple body of a man attacked by disease, and whose recovery depends upon the union of that which is in it. Therefore agree upon what we have established for you, and follow not the ways of the disunited. Verily, your God the Merciful loveth to see whosoever is in the world as one soul and one temple. Therefore avail yourselves of the bounty of God and his mercy in these days, the like of which the eye of creation hath never seen. Blessed is he who casteth away that which he hath, 
for the sake of desiring that which is on the part of God. Verily, we bear witness that he is of the successful. Tablet to Napoleon the Third. The development of the world, the training of nations, the tranquility of the servants, and the security of the people of all lands have been due to the divine precepts and ordinances. Religion is the greatest cause for the appearance of this great gift. It bestows the cup of vitality, confers immortal life, and imparts eternal benefit to the people. Ishraqat 39 The faith of God and religion of God hath been revealed and manifested from the heaven of the will of the king of pre-existence only for the union and concord of the dwellers upon earth make it not a cause of discord and dissension religious hatred and rancor is a world consuming fire and the quenching thereof most arduous unless the hand of divine might give men deliverance from this unfruitful calamity o people of the world ye are all the fruit of one tree and the leaves of one branch walk with perfect charity concord affection and agreement in whatever place we may be and whatever befall us the saints must gaze with perfect steadfastness and confidence towards the supreme horizon and occupy themselves in the reformation of the world and the education of the nations what hath befallen and shall befall hath been and is an instrument and means for the furtherance of the word of unity take hold of the command of god and cling thereto verily it hath been sent down from beside a wise ordainer traveller's narrative seventy three with perfect compassion and mercy have we guided and directed the people of the world to that whereby their souls shall be profited i declare by the sun of truth which hath shone forth from the highest horizons of the world that the people of baha had not and have not any aim save the prosperity and reformation of the world and the purifying of the nations Traveller's Narrative, 74 End of Section 15 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 16 Instructions O people of God, be not occupied with yourselves. Be intent on the betterment of the world and the training of nations. The betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and excellent deeds and well-approved and agreeable conduct. The helper of the cause is deeds, and its assistant is good character. O people of Baha, hold fast unto piety. Tablet of the World, 25 In this manifestation, victorious hosts are worthy deeds and morals and the leader and commander of these hosts is godlike piety this comprehends all and rules over all ishraqat 35 o ye wise men among nations turn your eyes away from foreignness and gaze unto oneness hold fast unto the means which conduce to the tranquillity and security of the people of the whole world this span wide world is but one native land and one locality abandon that glory which is the cause of discord and turn unto that which promotes harmony to the people of baha glory is in knowledge good morals and wisdom not in native land or station o people of the earth appreciate the worth of this heavenly word for it is like unto a ship for the sea of knowledge and is as the sun to the universe of perception words of paradise 
53 let not a man glory in this that he loves his country let him rather glory in this that he loves his kind traveler's narrative 11 well is it with him who is adorned with the decoration of manners and morals the pen of admonition exhorteth the friends and enjoineth on them charity pity wisdom and gentleness one holy action maketh the world of earth highest paradise traveler's narrative 76 o ye rich people when ye see a poor man do not grow proud and haughty and despise him but think from what ye were created for each one was created from despised water be truthful whereby your temples will be decorated your names elevated and your positions exalted among the people and you will have before god the truth a great reward o saints of god we enjoin on you chastity faithfulness godliness sincerity and purity lay aside the evil and adopt the good this is that whereunto ye are commanded in the book of god the knowing the wise well is it with those who practice o saints of god regard the horizons of uprightness and be quit severed and free from what is beside this there is no strength and no power save in god traveler's narrative 81 o people of god i exhort ye to courtesy or reverence courtesy is in the primary station the lord of all the virtues blessed is he who is illumined with the light of courtesy and is adorned with the mantle of uprightness tablet of the world 27 verily through meekness man is elevated to the heaven of power and again pride degrades him to the lowest station of humiliation and abasement words of paradise 40 the possessors of justice and equity occupy the highest station and loftiest rank the lights of righteousness and piety radiate and shine from such souls it is hoped that nations and countries may not be deprived of the lights of these two orbs tarazat eight trustworthiness is the greatest door to the security and tranquillity of mankind the stability of every affair depends upon it and the worlds of honor glory and affluence are illuminated by its light trustworthiness is the best garment for your temples and the most splendid crown for your heads tarazot nine the creatures were created through love all are commanded to live in friendship and unity now look to this carefully and mention this blessed word which has shone forth from the horizon of the mouth of the king of unity do not allow the opportunity to fall from your grasp and spend not your time uselessly i declare by the ocean of the godly knowledge that a moment in these days is more excellent than past centuries and ages to this beareth witness your lord the chooser in the generous station ye must burn up the veils by the flame of certainty and illumine the hearts and minds by the light of faith exert your intelligence that ye may drink from the stream of assurance which is overflowing from the right of the divine throne the one who will gain this is of the people of eternity blessed is a heart which is quickened by a breath of god and a tongue that is adorned with his praise throughout the worlds be kindled by this fire which is burning in the world that through thee 
whosoever is in this earth shall be enkindled. Think not that it is a fire, rather it is a light, and its traces shall surround whosoever is in all countries and regions. Be tranquil and confident through the bounty of God and his mercy. Tablet We enjoin upon the servants of God to be patient, self-constrained, tranquil and grave, that the cause of God may become manifest and prevalent between the earth and heaven. The glory of God is upon them who have cast aside imaginations and adopted for themselves a way to God, the owner of the safe retreat. Tablet Verily, he who doth not move by the breath of God in this day, he is indeed dead before God, the King of names and attributes. Arise from the graves of lusts, and advance to the kingdom of your Lord, the ruler of the throne and the earth, that ye may see that which was promised unto you on the part of your Lord, the All-Knowing. Do ye imagine that ye will be profited by what ye have? It will be possessed by someone in your stead, and ye shall return to the dust, without finding anyone to succor or help. Of what use is a life that is ruled by death, or a duration which vanisheth, or a grace that changeth. Set aside what ye have, and advance to the bounty of God, which hath been revealed in this wonderful name. Tablet to Emperor of Russia Be generous when in affluence, and grateful when thou art poor. Be faithful to the rights of others, let thy face be bright and open, and be a treasure to the poor and needy. Be an admonisher to the rich, and an answerer to those who call thee. Fulfill the promise thou givest, and in all matters be just and equitable. Be silent among multitudes of men, and upright in giving decisions. Be humble toward men, be a lamp in darkness, a comforter in troubles, a sea to the thirsty, a refuge to the afflicted, a helper, assistant, and succor to the oppressed. In actions and deeds be virtuous and pious, be a home to the stranger, a healing to the sick, a stronghold to him who asks for help, a sight to the blind, a path to him who goeth astray. Be thou the beauty of the face of truth, an adornment to the temple of faithfulness, a throne to the house of character and manners, a spirit to the body of the world, a banner to the hosts of justice, and a light to the horizon of goodness. Be thou as a dew to the fertile and rich ground, an ark to the sea of science, a star in the heaven of generosity, a diadem to the head of wisdom, a white spot on the forehead of time, and a fruit of the trees of humbleness. I ask God to protect thee from the fire of hatred and the chill of enmity, for he is the near, the answerer. Tablet to Badia. Be patient in misfortunes, and contented in all aspects. In the truth, be firm and unwavering. Be quick in doing good deeds. Be assiduous toward God. Be a veiler of people's faults. Be an avoider of lust. Be a runner to the truth. A cloud of bounty to the servants of God. Be kindly to thy debtors. Be a forgiver to the transgressors. Be a fulfiller of the covenant and steadfast to the cause. Thus doth the oppressed one admonish thee. Be pious and virtuous before God. He admonisheth thee to follow fidelity, truth, and faithfulness. They are incumbent upon thee. They are incumbent upon thee. Tablet to Zia Every soul is commanded by God 
to deliver the truth to the people who will surely be attracted by the words of such teachers if they be truth seekers otherwise his words will not have the least effect in the hearts of the worshippers of god thus doth god teach you verily he is the pardoner the merciful those who do wrong and oppress others and at the same time command the people to be just will by words coming out of their mouths be accused of lying and declared to be liars by the people of the kingdom and by those who go about the beauteous throne of thy lord tablet to napoleon the third the hearts god hath ever regarded the hearts of his servants and this too is by reason of his most great favor that perchance mortal souls may be cleansed and sanctified from earthly states and may attain unto everlasting places traveller's narrative one fifteen today let every soul desire to attain the highest station he must not regard what is in him but what is in god it is not for him to regard what shall advantage himself but that whereby the word of god which must be obeyed shall be upraised the heart must be sanctified from every form of selfishness and lust for the weapons of the unitarians and the saints were and are the fear of god traveller's narrative seventy six that which god glorious is his mention hath desired for himself is the hearts of his servants which are treasures of praise and love of the lord and stores of divine knowledge and wisdom the will of the eternal king hath ever been to purify the hearts of his servants from the promptings of the world and what is therein so that they may be prepared for illumination by the effulgences of the lord of the names and attributes therefore must no stranger find his way into the city of the heart so that the incomparable friend may come unto his own place that is the effulgence of his names and attributes not his essence exalted is he for that peerless king hath been and will be holy for everlasting above ascent or descent traveller's narrative one thirteen one fourteen o my friends hearken unto the advice of one who exhorteth you sincerely for the sake of god verily he hath created you and manifested unto you that which will elevate you profit you and make known unto you his right path and great message in truth piety is the first leader among the armies of the lord and its hosts are pleasing morals and pure deeds by these are the cities of hearts and minds conquered in all ages and centuries and the standards of victory and triumph are planted on the loftiest places ishragot twenty eight thou hast indeed created men to know thee and to serve thy cause whereby their stations may be exalted in thy earth and their souls be uplifted through that which thou hast revealed in thy epistles books and tablets the word ishragot sixteen were ye to taste a little of the clear water of divine knowledge ye would know that the real life is the life of the heart and not the life of the body for both animals and men share in the life of the body but this life is assigned to possessors of brilliant souls who drink from the ocean of faith and partake of the fruit of assurance this life is not followed by death nor this immortality by mortality as it is said a true believer is alive both in this world and the world to come Egon, eighty five by life and death recorded in the books is meant life through faith and death through unbelief 
it is owing to lack of comprehension of this meaning that in every manifestation the generality of people refused to believe were not directed to the sun of guidance and did not follow the eternal beauty o people of the earth the day of victory hath come and the speaker of the mount hath appeared with signs the like of which could not be produced by whosoever is in the heaven and earth we have forbidden any to work sedition and strife and ordain that victory be gained only through commemoration and explanation thus hath the matter been decreed from before the merciful in his evident and clear book tablet o people of baha subdue the cities of the hearts by the sword of wisdom and demonstration those who argue in accord with their own desire and wish they are in obvious wrong say the sword of wisdom is hotter than the summer and sharper than the sword of iron if ye are of those who know draw out that sword in my name and power then invade with it the cities of the hearts of those who are fortifying themselves in the fortress of desire every one who desireth victory must first subdue the city of his own heart with the sword of spiritual truth and of the word and must protect it from remembering aught beside god afterwards let him turn his regards towards the cities of others hearts this is what is meant by victory traveler's narrative 115 knowledge knowledge is divided into two kinds divine knowledge and satanic knowledge one appears from the inspiration of the ideal king the other emanates from the imaginations of darkened souls the teacher of one is the exalted god and the teacher of the other is sensual suggestion the explanation of one is fear god and god will teach you and the definition of the other is knowledge is the greatest veil the fruits of one tree are patience longing wisdom and love the fruits of the other are pride vainglory and conceit no scent of these obscure learnings the darkness of which hath encompassed all regions is inhaled from what the masters of utterance have explained concerning the meaning of knowledge the only fruit of this tree is injustice and iniquity and it yieldeth no crop but malice and hatred its fruit is a deadly poison and its shadow is a destructive fire Econ 50 knowledge is one of the greatest benefits of god to acquire knowledge is incumbent on all in this day the mysteries of this earth are unfolded and visible before the eyes and the pages of swiftly appearing newspapers are indeed the mirror of the world they display the doings and actions of the different nations do not consider that we have revealed unto you ordinances but rather that we have opened the seal of the sealed wine with the fingers of might and power did men but know what pure wine of the mercy of their lord the mighty the all-knowing was beneath the seal they would certainly cast aside reproach and seek to be satisfied by this servant but now have they veiled me with the veil of darkness which they have woven with the hands of doubts and fancies traveler's narrative 77 148 end of section 16 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 17 arts crafts and sciences knowledge is like unto wings for the being of man and is a ladder for ascending to acquire knowledge is incumbent on all but of those sciences which may profit the people of the earth and not such sciences as begin in mere words 
and end in mere words the possessors of sciences and arts have a great right among the people of the world indeed the real treasury of man is his knowledge knowledge is the means of honor prosperity joy gladness happiness and exaltation words of paradise 76 o people of baha the reflective faculty of the mind is the depository of crafts arts and sciences exert yourselves so that the gems of knowledge and wisdom may proceed from this ideal mine and conduce to the tranquillity and union of the different nations of the world words of paradise 58 occupations it is incumbent upon every one of you to engage in some one occupation such as arts trades and the like we have made this your occupation identical with the worship of god the true one reflect o people upon the mercy of god and upon his favors then thank him in mornings and evenings waste not your time in idleness and indolence and occupy yourselves with that which will profit yourselves and others beside yourself thus hath the matter been decreed in this tablet from the horizon from which the sun of wisdom and divine utterance is gleaming the most despised of men before god is he who sits and begs cling unto the rope of means relying upon god the causer of causes every soul who occupies himself in an art or trade this will be accounted an act of worship before god verily this is from no other than his great and abundant favor glad tidings 89 religion the people of wealth and men of honor and power must have the best possible regard for the respect of religion religion is a manifest light and a strong fortress for the protection and tranquillity of the people of the world for the fear of god commands people to do that which is just and forbids them that which is evil if the lamp of religion remain concealed agitation and anarchy would prevail and the orb of justice and equity and the sun of peace and tranquillity would be withheld from giving light every man of discernment testifieth to that which is here mentioned ishraqat 33 against the sword may the word arise against fierceness patience in place of oppression submission and at the time of martyrdom resignation traveler's narrative 78 blessed is the prince who succors a captive the rich one who favors the needy the just man who secures the right of a wronged one from the oppressor and the trustee who performs what he is commanded on the part of the pre-existent commander words of paradise 55 end of section 17 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 18 education the supreme pen enjoineth upon all to instruct and educate the children it is decreed that every father must educate his sons and daughters in learning and in writing and also in that which hath been ordained in the tablet he who neglects that which hath been commanded in this matter if he is rich 
it is incumbent on the trustees of the house of justice to recover from him the amount required for the education of the children otherwise i e if the parent is not capable the matter shall devolve on the house of justice verily we have made it the house of justice an asylum for the poor and needy ishraqat thirty seven he who educates his son or any other's children it is as though he hath educated one of my children upon such an one be my baha glory my providence and my mercy which hath embraced all in the world ishraqat thirty seven through union the regions of the world have ever been illuminated with the light of the divine cause the greatest means for this end is that the peoples should be familiar with each other's writing and language the trustees of the house of justice must select one tongue out of the present languages or a new language and likewise select one among the various writings and teach them to the children in the schools of the world so that the whole world may thereby be considered as one native land and one part ishraqat thirty six the learned who practice their knowledge and the wise who act justly they are as the spirit to the body of the world well is it with that learned man whose head is adorned with the crown of justice and whose body glorieth in the ornament of honesty traveller's narrative seventy five the heaven of divine wisdom is illumined and shining with two orbs consultation and kindness the tent of the order of the world is hoisted and established on two pillars reward and retribution ishraqat thirty four the righteous have always through good words taken possession of the gardens of existence tablet of the world twenty three precepts we have said and our saying is truth consort with all the people of religions with joy and fragrance through this utterance whatever was the cause of foreignness discord and disunion has been removed tablet of the world twenty eight the language of kindness is the lodestone of hearts and the food of the soul it stands in the relation of ideas to words and is an horizon for the shining of the sun of wisdom and knowledge o son of man if thou lookest towards mercy regard not that which benefits thee and hold to that which will benefit the servants mankind if thou lookest towards justice choose thou for others what thou choosest for thyself words of paradise forty in every country or government where any of this community reside they must behave toward that government with faithfulness trustfulness and truthfulness glad tidings eighty five if ye be slain for his good pleasure verily it is better for you than that ye should slay traveller's narrative one fifteen god hath prohibited unto men the drinking of wine traveller's narrative one thirty three it is not allowable to declare one's sins and transgressions before any man inasmuch as this has not been nor is conducive 
to securing God's forgiveness and pardon. At the same time, such confession before the creatures leads to one's humiliation and abasement, and God, exalted is his glory, doth not wish for the humiliation of his servants. Verily, he is compassionate and beneficent. A sinner must privately, between himself and God, beg for mercy from the sea of mercy, and ask forgiveness from the heaven of beneficence. Glad Tidings, 87. End of Section 18. The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase, Section 19. To Christians. O concourse of the sun, Christians, are ye hidden from myself because of my name? What maketh ye to doubt? Ye have called for your Lord, the self-dependent, night and day, and when he hath come from the heaven of pre-existence in his greatest glory, ye have not approached him and were of the heedless. Then consider those who turned away from the Spirit, Christ, when he came to them with manifest power. How many of the Pharisees were abiding in the temples in his name, and were entreating because of his separation. But when the gate of union was opened, and the light shone forth from the dayspring of beauty, they disbelieved in God, the exalted, and the great, and did not attain to his visitation. After having been promised thereunto in the book of Isaiah, as well as in the books of the prophets and the apostles, no one of them approached the dayspring of favor except those who were of no account among the people, but in whose names all the lords of evident honor boast at the present day. Remember, the most learned doctors of his country in his age condemned him to be murdered, whilst one who was a catcher of fishes believed in him. Be astonished thereat, and be of those who remember. Verily, we have come unto you, and have endured the abominations of the world because of your salvation. Do ye flee from him who hath redeemed his soul for your lives? Fear God, O concourse of the Spirit, and follow not all learned men who are afar. Do ye suppose that he hath desired his soul after being at every instant under the swords of the enemy, or that he desired the world after being imprisoned in the most ruined of cities? Then judge thereupon and follow not the oppressors. Open the doors of your minds. Verily, the Spirit standeth behind them. What maketh ye to keep afar from him who hath desired to bring ye nigh to the shining abode? Say, Verily, we have opened unto you the gates of the kingdom. Are ye closing the doors of your houses before my face? Verily, this is not but a great error. Say, Verily, he hath come from heaven as he came from it the first time. Beware lest ye contradict that which he saith, as the nations before you contradicted that which he said. Likewise I make known unto you the truth, if you are of those who know. Verily, the Spirit of truth hath come to guide you into all truth. Verily, he speaketh not unto you from himself, nay, but rather from before the all-knowing, the wise. Say, he is the one whom the Son hath glorified, and hath upraised his command. Abandon that which is before you, O people of the earth, and take that which is commanded you from before the powerful, the faithful. Purify your ears, and turn your minds to hear the sweet call which hath arisen from the direction of Sinai, the abode of your most glorious Abha Lord. 
Verily, he attracteth you unto a station wherein you will behold the lights of the face which have shone forth from this brilliant horizon. Say, Verily, he hath shone forth from the direction of the Orient, and his signs have appeared in the Occident. Think thereupon, O people, and be not like unto those who neglected the remembrancer when he came unto them from before the mighty, the laudable. Awake by the breezes of God. Verily, they have blown in the world. Blessing to whosoever hath found their fragrance and is of the assured. Blessed is whosoever is illumined by the sun of my word. Blessed is whosoever adorned his head with the wreath of my love. Blessed is he who was assured in my word and stood up among the dead for my remembrance. Blessed is he who was attracted by my melodies and tore the coverings by my power. Blessed is he who cut himself from all other than me, soared in the ether of my love, entered my kingdom, and perceived the dominions of my might, drank the kawthar, fountain of my favor, and the salsabil, spring of my grace, was apprised of my command, and of whatsoever was hidden in the treasuries of my words, and shone forth from the horizon of inner significance in my commemoration and my praise. Verily, he is of mine. May my mercy, grace, favor, and glory be upon him. From Lauhul Akdas, the Holy Tablet. O people of the sun, we have sent unto you John the Baptist another time, the Bob. Verily he crieth in the wilderness of the Bayan, the Bob's writings. O creation of beings, make clear your eyes. The day of vision and meeting hath come nigh. Prepare ye the way, O people of the gospel. The day wherein shall come the Lord of glory hath come nigh. Prepare to enter into the kingdom. Tablet to Pope The breath of God, the Word, is diffused throughout the world, because the desired one hath come in his most great glory. Lo, every stone and clod crieth, the promised one hath appeared, and the kingdom is to God, the powerful, the mighty, the forgiver. Beware lest sciences prevent thee from the king of what is known, or the world from him who created it and left it. Arise in the name of thy Lord the Merciful among the assembly of beings, and take the cup of life in the hand of assurance. Drink therefrom or not, then give to drink to those of the people of different religions who advance. Verily, he hath come from heaven another time, as he came from it the first time. Beware lest ye oppose him, as the Pharisees opposed him, without evidence or proof. On his right side floweth the river of grace, and on his left side the sweet waters of justice. Before him go the angels of paradise with the standards of signs. Beware lest names withhold you from God, the maker of the earth and the heavens. Tablet to Pope O people of the earth, advance toward him who hath advanced toward you, for verily he is the face of God among you. His evidence is in your midst, and his proof unto you, and he hath come to you with signs, the word, the like of which the most learned have failed to produce. The tree of Mount Sinai, Moses, speaketh in the bosom of the world, and the Holy Spirit, Christ, crieth among the nations, Lo, the desired one hath come with evident dominion. Tablet to Napoleon the Third. Fear God, O people of discernment, 
the glorious one crieth continually from the horizon of the pavilion of might and greatness and saith o people of the gospel he hath come into the kingdom who was out of it and today we see you standing at the gate rend the veils by the power of your lord the mighty the munificent and then enter into my kingdom in my name thus doth he command you who desireth for you enduring life verily he is powerful over all things blessed are those who have known the light and have hastened toward it behold they are in the kingdom they eat and drink with the elect and we see you o children of the kingdom in darkness this is not meat for you do ye fear to meet the light because of your deeds advance thereunto verily he said come that i may make you my fishers come that i may make you fishers of men today we say come that we may make you the vivifiers of the world thus was the decree ordained in a tablet written by the pen of command tablet to pope o people of the gospel the door of heaven was opened and the one who hath ascended thereunto is come again crying throughout the land and sea and preaching to all of this manifestation whereof the tongue of greatness hath uttered the promise hath come and this is the promised one be firm so that nothing of the concerns of this world cause thee to slip take the cup of straightforwardness in the name of the possessor of creation and drink thereof with the permission of god the king of the kingdom tablet this victim baha'u'llah hath made himself a target for the arrows of calamity unto the showing forth of the treasures deposited in men's souls traveller's narrative seventy eight verily we have not desired anything for ourselves but only for yourselves were ye of the just we have submitted to the swords of the enemies for the sake of your life and to this will bear witness every fair and rightly informed one we have turned away from whatsoever is upon the whole earth for the purpose of bringing you to the region of the mercy of your lord the clement the compassionate tablet the ultimate criterion if we seek to become acquainted with the truth of this matter through the accounts and stories which are in the mouths of men the truth will be entirely concealed and hidden by reason of their manifested differences and contrariety it is therefore best to discover the principles and objects of this people from the contents of their teachings tracts and epistles there is no authority nor are there any proofs or texts superior to these for this is the foundation of foundations and the ultimate criterion one cannot judge of the generality by the speech or action of individuals for diversity of states is one of the peculiarities and concomitants of the human race traveller's narrative one fifty five end of section nineteen the Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase, Section 20 Salvation Ye must be born again. Salvation means attainment of the high destiny which God has made possible for every man. No two persons are alike, and it is probable that no two have exactly the same destiny, but each has a special work to perform and his own heavenly niche in the great universal divine economy that place of service which shall be the fullness of his capacity and the joy of his soul the opportunity is his to accomplish the purpose of his being by the help of god if he wills so to do if he refuses to listen to his father's invitation 
he cannot attain that exaltation and glorious service of eternal life and is a loser of all he might have been the bahai teaching describes the process of attainment through the spirit of faith as follows the effulgence of god called spirit according to man's comprehension is generally divided or classified into five grades or planes one the vegetable spirit two the animal spirit three the human spirit four the spirit of faith five the divine spirit of holiness one the vegetable spirit is the virtue augmentative a growing of vegetative faculty which results from the admixture of the simple elements with the cooperation of water air and heat two the animal spirit is the virtue perceptive resulting from the admixture and absorption of the vital elements generated in the heart which apprehend sense impressions three the human spirit consists of the rational coordinative faculty which apprehends general ideas and things intelligible and perceptible now these spirits are not reckoned as spirit in the terminology of the scriptures inasmuch as the laws governing them are as the laws which govern all other phenomenal beings in respect to generation and corruption production change and reversion existences belonging to the phenomenal or material universe called the world of generation and corruption this is clearly mentioned in the gospels where it says let the dead bury their dead and that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit inasmuch as he who would bury the dead was alive with the vegetable and animal spirits and the rational human soul yet christ declared such to be dead and devoid of life because empty of the spirit of faith which is the kingdom of god in brief these three spirits one two three are subordinate to reversion production and corruption but the spirit of faith four which is of the kingdom of god consists of the all comprehending grace and the perfect attainment salvation fruition achievement unto the divine spirit of holiness five this latter phase of the effulgence of truth from the presence of the divine unity shining on luminous light-seeking human essences is called the holy spirit by this spirit is the life of the spirit of man when it is fortified thereby as christ said that which is born of spirit is spirit he who is quickened by it is of the kingdom of god he is then eternal everlasting divine heavenly and shall continue with the continuance of his lord no longer subordinate to the laws which govern the universe of matter because the spirit of faith and the spirit of divine holiness are vitalized with the attributes of their source god who everlastingly was and is and shall be thus it is that the one who is born of this spirit obtains everlasting life jesus said marvel not that i said unto thee ye must be born again verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god end of section twenty the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section twenty one what shall i do to be saved it may be asked how can man attain the spirit of faith and the endowment of the holy spirit this is the most vital question that man can propound the great majority of the christian churches have taught that salvation is by faith which is most certainly true and also that faith is an intellectual assent to the statement expressed in two lines of a hymn jesus paid it all all the debt i owe this statement is true in one sense but 
cowardly, degrading, and ineffective for him who simply accords mental belief to the dogma and assents gladly in his heart to casting the burden of his sin and wickedness upon the suffering and crucified Christ. Jesus paid it all indeed for him who believed on him and took up his cross and followed him, who proved the sincerity and actuality of his belief by his deeds of obedience. He said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14.27 Matthew 10.38 So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14.33 as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James 2.28 It is evident to any reader of the Gospels that the central, vital element of man's salvation was declared to be faith, faith in the Christ, proved by works of righteousness, and that mere intellectual assent was not an effective faith. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. James 2.19 It appears that faith must be of such a character that it changes a man, severs him from attachment from everything of the world, causes him to bear the burden of the cross, the sacrifice of his will, his desires, his life if need be, and so to devote his entire being to the will of God as expressed in his commands. This kind of faith has its first impulse in the will of man. It often arises from suffering and the sense of need, and it always increases that consciousness. Faith is not an intellectual yielding to argument through being convinced that certain statements are correct, but it is rather from a hunger of the soul, a knowledge of personal helplessness and the perception of a possible mighty helpfulness. Faith cannot rely on any man, but in God only. The required help must come from a higher power than man. The soul is craving that which does not pertain to humanity itself. The latent spark of divine longing is awaking to seek its promise, and it turns heavenward for the dawn of hope. It is looking for its Father, God. Therefore, it is necessary that man shall have some knowledge of God, and for this he must turn toward the face of God. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me, and answer me, when thou saidst, Seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 27, 8 His face is the revelation of himself in the realm of existence where man dwells. All the existence declares God and teaches of him. But the heart knowledge, the living knowledge, comes through his incarnate word, the human manifestation of his will. Therefore, man must seek and find the manifestation of God, believe in him, accept his word, obey his commands, and follow him in the pathway of sacrifice. The manifestation of God may be always known because he provides the kind of help which the seeking soul requires heart help, spirit help, creating help. Man is a praying creature. When he finds himself in need, as he does from the moment of his birth, he strives by all means at his command to pray for help. All through his life he seeks aid from others. He is always in need, always begging for assistance. When he is awakened through any means, to the hunger and helplessness of his soul, he hesitates not to pray to God, and whatever may be thought of the action and working of prayer, 
it causes man to turn toward god and make it possible for god to answer him prayer changes his attitude from selfward to godward if he prays for things that pertain to his worldly affairs his spirit is not turned toward god but toward himself his prayer must be in the name of god that is in accord with the divine word jesus told his disciples to ask in his name and said that whatever they asked in his name they received name is a term used to express qualities and the name of the manifestation of god signifies divine attributes therefore to ask in his name means according to his nature and instructions which are the nature and instructions of god no prayer is prayer to god unless it be in god's way according to his word and with a sincere desire for his will to be done regardless of the personal will prayer in its essence is the abandonment of the personal will in favor of the will of god and such prayer god answers because it is in agreement with his law and can be answered god asks man to pray to him he has given freely everything for the necessities of human life he has filled the lands and waters with foods and taught man how to cultivate and use them he has given the forests and all materials for shelter the cotton and the wool and enabled man to mold them for his comfort he has given the reasoning faculties that man may progress in material welfare and exercise the ethical and moral knowledges offered to him he has given conceptions of beauty that man may seek for more than the physical dimensions of existence and he has implanted the perception of higher possibilities and a desire for eternal destinies that man may turn his face toward the infinite all of these have been without the asking but for the greater spiritual things god tells man to pray that in so doing he may recognize his need prove the reality of his desire and put himself into the only attitude in which he can receive one must face forward and hold out his hand if he would have the gift he must meet the donor part way otherwise there is no real gift he who is in need will pray he who hesitates to supplicate god for his most valuable treasures is standing in the station of pride or has not awakened to their worth and his own need every man has what he desires the most if it can be obtained the spirit of faith is attainable but it is so infinitely higher and more valuable than all else in existence that all other things must loosen their hold on his heart before it can reign god demands obedience it is not for man to question god's commands a little thought shows that all the ordinances of god expressed by his manifestation are for the uplifting and good of man how then can he question the methods revealed from the same source the scriptures throughout lay stress upon obedience as of the utmost importance in the sight of god and he who would attain the higher blessings should welcome the opportunities to obey everything in existence is under law and all things obey freely except man who has been granted ability to disobey even god and to obey himself man is always a servant he obeys something how much better for him to serve the wise one the true one the beautiful one instead of his own ignorance and greed know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness romans 6 16. 
the whole sin and consequent degradation of the jewish people was their disobedience to god he called them again and again to be his people obey my voice and i will be your god and ye shall be my people and walk ye in all the ways that i have commanded you that it may be well with you jeremiah 7:23 obey i beseech thee the voice of the lord which i speak unto thee so shall it be well unto thee and thy soul shall live jeremiah 38:20 the path of faith which is the way of life is to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ 2 corinthians 10.5. This is obedience to the manifestation of God in whatever age he may appear. The voice of God speaking through Baha'u'llah says, O son of existence, keep my commands for love of me and deny thyself thine own desires if thou wishest my pleasure. O son of man, neglect not my laws if thou lovest my beauty and forget not my counsels if thou art hopeful to attain my will faith is entire confidence few recognize the value of confidence and the power of the will to induce it when we retire from thoughts of earthly affairs to consider the word of god we find that naught is there but the things of value the best ways such as wisdom knowledge justice mercy generosity beauty power and love whereas the opposites pertain to the natural man then it is easy for the sincere heart to turn itself toward the source of these things of worth and to trust the giver of them a little true exercise of the will and purpose will soon establish the spirit in that direction and then the spirit of god meets it and confirms it in a certainty that is beyond all that the highest philosophy or human effort can accomplish o fleeting shadow pass by the low degrees of fancy and soar to the exalted heights of certainty o my brother hear my beautiful words from my sweet tongue and drink the water of life from the fountain of my lips that is sow the seeds of my innate wisdom in the pure ground of the heart and water it with conviction that the hyacinth of my knowledge and wisdom shall spring up verdantly in the holy city of the heart baha'u'llah the whole question of salvation is one of the will of man god wills it for man if he will but god has endowed him with a will of his own to choose what he will and he never interferes with the free use of that gift he has made man after his own image giving him a consciousness of individuality of independence the power of judgment between good and evil a perception of values and a will to make decisions all these are god qualities not dust qualities as long as man considers these powers to be his own to spring from himself and uses them only for his own worldly aggrandizement he may advance in his plane of human life but can never rise above that plane to a higher and nobler condition when he is led to search the scriptures and learns that there are better things that god is the giver of all that he has and is that it is possible for him to come into closer communion with him and knowledge of him through his manifestation and his word then the wise man the true-hearted one turns to god and seeks to know his will he learns that all these powers were given him to enable him to grow to prepare himself under the guidance of the spirit for a higher service 
in God's universe. This is told in the parable likening the kingdom of heaven to the use of the talents, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. These endowments of man are his talents given him for use. He who uses them in such a manner as to gain others, that is, uses them according to the divine instructions, is not only called the good and faithful servant, but is also told, Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many. While he who had buried his talent in the ground of himself and his desires lost the talent he had and was cast as an unprofitable servant into outer darkness. This life is a primary school in which to prepare for greater service and knowledge and larger responsibilities in the future. God offers to man the wonderful station of sonship to him, which means that man must become like him. 1 John 3, 2 be of divine character reliable able to render nobler service and to be entrusted with the affairs of his father's house little does man conceive the meaning of those many things over which god desires him to rule but he must first rule himself and he is unable to do even this without the aid of the spirit of god although all power all strength all ability is the pure gift of god through his holy spirit yet his law is that man shall grow into a power of capacity for these gifts by the right use of that which he already has he will not remove man's apparent independence his apparent individuality his freedom of will he will not unman him and make him an automaton. Therefore, it becomes necessary for man to use his own faculties under the guidance of God's word and in unison with his spirit in order that he may receive the glorious endowments of his father. Naught can be accomplished until the will of God be supreme in the will of the man, until he can say with his whole being, there is no god but god i will have no other gods before him praise be unto his holy name a man's spirit may be called the aspect of his will when he turns it toward listening he hears toward looking he sees toward thinking he perceives all of these are limited within the sensual human plane but when he directs his spirit toward the word of God, he receives instruction of a higher object of devotion, who is wisdom itself, knowledge itself, love itself. And then, in response to the invitation of the word, he turns his spirit toward that one and sends forth the wireless supplications from his heart to the heart of the universe as he does this in all sincerity there comes to him an assurance a confidence in a new connection a new help a new power a presence and strength which are reliable impregnable and life-giving his seeking spirit has been met by a mightier spirit as was the prodigal son by the father his spirit has been quickened and impregnated by a holier spirit a new conception a new birth has taken place within him his spirit has become the spirit of faith and is made alive with the spirit of holiness shining forth from the presence of the divine unity on the luminous light-seeking human essence of himself then his spirit being at one with the holy spirit of god is vitalized with the attributes of their source god who everlastingly was and is and shall be the human spirit has an impression and effect in the world but the divine spirit gives life to the souls and confers eternal life 
upon those who are attracted to the fragrances of God. This is the great cause from the kingdom of thy Lord. Be attracted to this new spirit which hath effective power in the realities of things and creates new creatures. Forsake every thought, every remembrance and every praise while holding to the word of God. Confine thy interests, thy works and efforts to the cause of God. Thus the spirit of power and might will confirm thee, and the manifest light will shine upon thy brow. Thank God that he enriched thee beyond the delicacies of this mortal world, and cause thee to taste the sweetness of his love in his new kingdom. Abdul Baha. End of section 21. The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase. Section 22. The Baha'i Revelation. The Baha'i Revelation is an invitation to love God. The Word of God, speaking through Baha'u'llah, says, O Son of Man, in my ancient entity and in my eternal being was I hidden. I knew my love in thee, therefore I created thee. Upon thee I laid my image, and to thee revealed my beauty. Arabic Hidden Words 4 O son of man, I loved thy creation, therefore I created thee. Wherefore love me, that I may acknowledge thee, and in the spirit of life confirm thee. Arabic Hidden Words 5 O friend, in the garden of the heart, plant only the flowers of love, and withdraw not from clinging to the nightingale of love and yearning. Persian Hidden Words 3 O son of love, only one step separates thee from the plain of nearness and the exalted tree of love. Plant the first foot and with the other step into the kingdom of eternity and enter the pavilion of immortality. Then hearken to what hath descended from the pen of glory. O son of glory, be swift in the way of holiness and step into the heavens of intimacy clear the heart with the burnish of the spirit and betake thyself to the presence of the most high persian hidden words seven eight these are the words of divine love none but the king of love can utter such commands each of god's teachers has revealed the same expressing it according to the human needs of his time and place. Moses the lawgiver said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy 6.5 Jesus the Son repeated the command of Moses, and said, This is the first and great commandment. Today, the Father calls, O Son of Existence, love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love can never reach thee. Know this, O servant. Arabic Hidden Words 6. Love me that I may acknowledge thee, and in the spirit of life confirm thee. Arabic Hidden Words 5. But how can man love God? whom no eye hath seen. He himself answers and says, My love is in thee. Seek, and thou wilt find me near. I have placed within thee a spirit from me, that thou mightest be my lover. Arabic Hidden Words 20 The source of love is to advance to the beloved, to abandon all else save him, and to have no hope save his will the baha'i revelation is an invitation to
to obedience. Baha'u'llah himself first obeyed the commands of God and then proclaimed them to us. Note carefully these commands which were completely manifested in him. O son of humanity, the temple of being is my throne. Purge it of everything that I may descend to reign over it. Arabic Hidden Words, 59. O son of existence, thy heart is my home. Purify it for my descent. Thy spirit is my outlook. Prepare it for my manifestation. Arabic Hidden Words, 60. If my will thou seekest, regard not thine own, that thou mayest die in me, and I live in thee. Arabic Hidden Words, 8. O son of man, magnify my command, that I may reveal to thee the secrets of greatness, and illumine thee with the lights of eternity. Arabic Hidden Words, 42. O son of man, lift up thy heart with delight, that thou mayest be fitted to meet me and to mirror forth my beauty. Arabic Hidden Words, 37. These are the divine counsels to him who would be a manifestation of God. They were absolutely fulfilled in the blessed perfection and offered by him to all mankind. They are also entirely obeyed in Abdul Baha, the servant of Baha, the perfect man and exemplar to all men in the new covenant and dispensation of God. He who obeys these commands becomes a Baha'i, that is, a manifester of the name of God, of godlike attributes, according to the degree of the purity of his heart. The pure in heart shall see God, yes, and the pure-hearted shall mirror forth his beauty. Thus is the command of the Spirit obeyed, the same eternal Spirit which said through the blessed mouth of Jesus, Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 516 no man can glorify god by adding to his glory but each soul can glorify god by so purging and polishing his own life that the holy attributes of god shall reflect from him to his neighbor and thus to all humanity this is to be a christian to be a baha'i the alphabet of love is obedience. O son of existence, keep my commands for love of me, and deny thyself thine own desires if thou wishest my pleasure. Arabic Hidden Words, 39. O son of man, neglect not my laws if thou lovest my beauty, and forget not my counsels if thou art hopeful to attain my will. Arabic Hidden Words, 40. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. John 15.10 If ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14.15 If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. The word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. John 14, 23 Obedience to the commands of God as revealed to man through his messengers is the only path to attainment of his spiritual blessings and bounties. It is for this that the men of God are sent. That man, wandering far from knowledge of his truth, 
troubled in the maze of man-made doctrines discouraged with uncertainties and blinded by earthly clouds of material philosophies may again perceive the light of truth the revelation of god's instruction shining forth in the dawn of a new day and that perceiving he may walk in the light recognize the gift of god and humbly obey him line upon line precept upon precept this is the divine way if we fail to learn his lesson in one of the days of god his love and generosity offer the teachings to us again and again they are always the same yet ever changing in expression to meet our capacity and our need end of section 22 the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section 23 the baha'i revelation is of authority in these days of tumults when churches sects dogmas and sciences are antagonizing each other with assertions and denials when all is cloud change and uncertainty when material wars mental tempests psychic dangers and spiritual temptations surround and attack us everywhere when religions of authority are derided and scorned when the entity of god is denied on the one hand and divided among innumerable individuals on the other is it not refreshing and delightful to hear a voice a trumpet of god crying out again from the wilderness prepare ye the way of the lord make straight his paths isaiah 43 malachi 3 1 mark 1 3 for he whom god shall manifest bayon cometh o son of spirit the gospel of light i herald to thee rejoice in it and to the state of holiness i call thee abide in it that thou mayest be in peace for ever and ever arabic hidden words thirty four o son of perception look thou to my face and turn from all save me for my authority is eternal and shall never cease my kingdom is lasting and shall not be overthrown if thou seekest another than me yea if thou searchest the universe for evermore yet shall thy search be vain arabic hidden words sixteen o son of man if thou run through all immensity and speed through the space of heaven thou shalt find no rest save in obedience to our command and in devotion before our face arabic hidden words forty one o son of man go not beyond thy limitation nor claim what is not for thee venerate the countenance of thy lord the almighty arabic hidden words twenty five what is that face that countenance but the human manifestation of his will the revealer of his command the proclaimer of his authority it is as necessary for the mind of man to have an empowered teacher and for his spirit to have a center of divine authority as for the earth to have a sun shining from its heaven man did not spring full armed from the soil he is a creature of growth an evolution and only that can be evolved which has first been involved all the earthly kingdoms of matter reach the fulfillment of their destinies under and by the influence of the sun's rays and man the fruitage and monarch of earth and the embryo of heaven cannot attain his heavenly possibilities except by virtue of the rays of command shining from the spiritual sun of truth the day-star of revelation 
prepared and appointed by God to show forth his light and declare his will. This revelation is called in the Arabic language Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, the shining light of his knowledge, the outpouring of his love, the revealing of his will. The title Baha'u'llah is also given to the man, the instrument of light. It is a perfect revelation of God's manifestation in existence, containing the essence of all revelations, so it and he are called the blessed perfection. As manifested perfection is beauty, he is called the beauty of God. Indeed, all good names belong to this shining sun of glory, who is the manifester of God's will and the speaker of authority. The Baha'i Revelation teaches the religion of living. It is my life, your life, not philosophy, not meditation alone, not mysticism, not preaching or hearing, but doing. Doing every day that which makes an advance and starts at least one ripple of progress in the little world of which the doer is temporarily the center. It is effort, struggle to make today better than yesterday, and to lay a new foundation, a higher base for the building of tomorrow. There can be no life without change. Stagnation is death. As religion is life, it demands action and the doing of that which will cause change and produce growth. Man dies daily, as the Apostle Paul said of himself and the old dead cells must be replaced by the new, the higher, stronger, better, that it may serve for an advance in the scale of being. Thus is the new creature born every day, yes, in each thought, each purpose, each act. The rim of the rolling wheel of life touches the earth of existence a point at a time, moment after moment. Its progress and direction depend upon the living of the now, this instant, upon which hangs our eternity. We have to watch but a moment at a time, this little particle of life, to make the best of it. Baha'u'llah has written, O son of existence, examine thy deeds each day before thou art judged, for death will suddenly overtake thee and then thy deeds shall judge thee. Arabic Hidden Words, 32. Guidance hath ever been by words, but at this time it is by deeds, that is, all pure deeds must appear from the temple of man, because all are partners in words, but pure and holy deeds belong especially to our friends. Then strive with your life to be distinguished among all people by deeds. Thus we exhort ye in the holy and radiant tablet. Persian Hidden Words, 76. The effect of deeds is in truth more powerful than that of words. The progress of man depends upon faithfulness, wisdom, chastity, intelligence, and deeds. The truth of words is tested by deeds and dependent upon life. Deeds reveal the station of the man. Words of Wisdom 62 It is the living of men which attracts the noble aspirations of others. End of section 23 The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase Section 24 This revelation is a call to sacrifice to the sacrifice of pure dying and pure living, dying to self and living to God. O son of humanity, if thou lovest me, turn away from thyself. If my will thou seekest, regard not thine own, that thou mayest die in me, and I live in thee. Arabic Hidden Words 8 O son of spirit, no peace is ordained for thee 
save by departing from thyself and coming to me. Arabic Hidden Words 9 O Son of Life, forget all save me, and be comforted by my spirit. Arabic Hidden Words 17 O Son of the Earth, if thou desirest me, desire no other than me. Persian Hidden Words 31 O my servant, free thyself from the worldly bond and escape from the prison of the self. Persian Hidden Words 40 Repeatedly man is counseled to escape from attachment to the things of earth and self and to turn his desire and confidence to God only. He is urged to abandon the evil and seek the good. O my servant, purge the mind from malice and free from envy enter the presence of unity. Persian Hidden Words 42 O sons of hope, divest yourselves of the garment of pride and lay aside the robe of haughtiness. Persian Hidden Words 47 O essence of passion, greed must be abandoned that thou mayest find content, for the greedy hath ever been deprived while the contented hath ever been loved and esteemed. Persian Hidden Words 50 O children of dust, giving and generosity are qualities of mine. Happy is he who adorns himself with my virtues. Persian Hidden Words 49 To be poor in all save God is a great blessing. Make it not small, for in the end it will make thee rich in God. Persian Hidden Words 53 in times past, religious sacrifice was interpreted to mean deprivation of material possessions and comforts, seclusion from the world and from human intercourse. It was considered to be separation from things as the only means of severance from attachment to things. True sacrifice is spiritual, not material only. It is the sacrifice of a meek and contrite spirit that the Lord requires. In this day of light, God does not demand the exclusion and casting away of that which we have, unless we hold it for evil and it offend us. Everything is good and of his bounty, and is a blessing if properly used. He says, O son of dust! All things in the heavens and in the earth have I ordained for thee, except the hearts, which I have appointed as a place for the descent of the manifestation of my beauty and glory. Persian Hidden Words 27 God, who is love, demands the sacrifice of all other loves if they prevent the lover from him. He wills to be loved above all that is. Christ, speaking the word of God, said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that saveth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10.37 The meaning of the word sacrifice is to make holy, and true sacrifice is making holy every possession, each thought and deed, holy unto the Lord. It is a consecration of spirit, soul, and body, to the will of God, making our will subservient to him and his will, the motive of each purpose and act, doing all things for the sake of God. Then truly man dies to self and God lives in him, and thus his life becomes holy. When this form of sacrifice shall prevail among men 
and the will of God inspires them in society, in business, in politics, religion, and life, then indeed shall this earth become a paradise of glory. Then all life becomes a radiant sacrifice, and the prophecy of Zechariah 1420 shall be fulfilled. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. The Baha'i teaching is an invitation to service. The people of Baha must serve the Lord with wisdom, teach others by their lives, and manifest the light of God in their deeds. In this day all must serve God with purity and virtue. Words of Paradise 61 Service is a manifestation of God, for he serves all existence. He is the provider, and we are under his providence. He is the giver, and we receive his gifts. He is the generous, and we seek his favor. The only way we can praise him and give thanks is by imitating him in service to humanity, and this is acceptable as service to God. Service in his name and according to his commands is oneness with him. If man desires to be conscious of unity with the Spirit of God, let him learn the will of God and serve humanity as God serves all. We cannot serve God. He needs no creature's service. Neither can we serve ourselves alone because such selfishness results in death, not life. But we can serve others. We can train ourselves to grow in strength and ability to serve humanity, that is, our neighbor, the ones near to us and around us, as well as those far away, excluding none from our service. That is God's service, for two reasons, because it is obeying his command, and because it is godlike in man that we serve. It is written that if one have nine bad qualities, and but one that is good, it is our duty to notice and praise the good, that its growth be encouraged. Each human being has something of the image of God in him, and it is a blessing to us if we be able to serve that godlike quality and aid it to shine forth. O son of man, I knew my love in thee, therefore I created thee. Upon thee I laid my image, and to thee revealed my beauty. Arabic Hidden Words 4 It is that image and that beauty which we delight to serve, no matter how faint its reflection. Indeed, the less it appears, the more it demands our service and help in the name of God. O son of man, withhold not from my servant in whatsoever he may ask of thee, for his face is my face, and thou must reverence me. Arabic Hidden Words 31 When any member of the body is ill, all the other members endeavor to restore it to health, because all are affected by its illness. So the health of humanity is disturbed by the ignorance, weakness, and sin of its members. And all should strive, under the guidance of the great physician, to heal the sicknesses of the world, as they appear in one or many of its creatures. And this soul healing, this overcoming evil with good, is to be done by encouraging the good and instilling the precepts of spiritual health. O son of man, breathe not the sins of any one as long as thou art a sinner. If thou doest contrary to this command, thou art not of me. To this I bear witness. Arabic Hidden Words 28 O son of existence, Attribute not to any soul that which thou desirest not to be attributed to thyself. Arabic Hidden Words, 30. 
Fault-finding and unkind criticism are not service either to God or to man. It is our own deeds that we must examine and criticize, but service is to discover and exalt the good in others and aid them in their efforts for good. Today, the great exemplar of the Baha'i Revelation is Abdul Baha, the servant of God, who serves all mankind with no recompense except the joy of obedience. He is the appointed interpreter of the expressed will of God as written in the scriptures. He has borne exile and imprisonment for the sake of the beloved of God. He is no respecter of persons and serves all alike, giving to the poor and ignorant what befits their need, to the rich, the learned, the strong, that which benefits them. He commands those who seek God's will in preference to their own to serve their enemies as their friends, their oppressors as brothers, to heal the sick, aid the weary, strengthen the weak, and help the afflicted, to be faithful and trustworthy in all conditions, patient under trial, strong in adversity, joyful in suffering, and to be content with what God gives. All this is service, the using of the talents entrusted to us for the benefit of mankind, and the upholding of the banner of righteousness. Not the least service is that of example, and, though a man open not his mouth, he serves greatly the cause of God, and the uplifting of humanity by simply living as God asks of him. No one is so small that his life does not influence others. The good character of that influence constitutes service. So this means of oneness with God is open to every soul, no matter how poor or weak he may be. All souls are very poor and helpless who do not try to serve in some way, while he who uses the little he has will surely grow in strength and capacity to receive more. Among those who have accepted the Baha'i revelation in the Orient, the desire to serve is remarkable, so much so that the name Baha'i has become a synonym for trustworthiness and reliable service. The natural desire of man is to be served, but the Baha'i esteems ability to serve others as a blessing. He watches for opportunity and seizes upon it as on a treasure. No matter how small or insignificant the act, he serves with such gladness and constancy that it has become noteworthy and has made the name Baha'i honored. Furthermore, this service breeds courtesy and inculcates love. It becomes an expression of love, so that the Baha'is there are not only the most serving people in the world, but also the most courteous and loving. As service implies consideration of the desires of others and the relinquishment of one's own, therein are the elements of true politeness, of affection, of heaven itself. No wonder that the conditions of the millennium are already visible among those people, and that the Baha'i religion is called a new garden of paradise. It is written, O people of the delectable paradise, let the people of certainty know that a new garden has appeared near the paradise in the open court of holiness, and that all the people of the heights and the temples of the exalted heaven are around it. Persian Hidden Words, 18. O people of my garden, I set the plant of your love and friendship in the holy garden of paradise with the hand of tenderness and watered it with the showers of mercy the time for its fruitage is at hand persian hidden words 34 o my servants ye are the trees of my garden ye must bear fresh and beautiful fruits that ye and others may be profited by them persian hidden words 80 the life of Jesus was one of pure servitude, 
and of example. How often he said, Follow me! He gave similar lessons of service in many commands and parables, such as those of the Good Samaritan, the moat and beam, the division of the sheep and goats. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, ye have done it unto me. He said, and it was a prophecy, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23, 11. The service of man to man, especially to the weak and helpless, has been the command of God in all ages, and now it is given again with the power of the word and of example, and through Abdu'l-Baha it is made the center of the new covenant of God with men for this age of peace, the millennium of consummation. End of section 24 the Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase, Section 25, Universal Love The command of unity requires the cultivation of universal love, which is the love of God expressed in love to man. All love is given to man to teach him the value of love. One needs but to calmly consider human love, to learn many lessons of the value and meaning of love. Love teaches sacrifice, especially of the personal will. The lover always seeks to learn the wish or will of the beloved, and then to make his own will serve that will. This law runs all through the degrees of love, from lowest to highest. The manifestation or proof of love is giving, or sacrifice of self. Self-love is hatred. It hates all that does not conduce or give to it. Love means giving, and he who gives most receives most. God, the generous, the giver, is love itself. He gives all that is in existence. Everything that man has is a free gift. His power to think, to know, to live, to work, to enjoy, to be, is all the pure gift of God. What can he offer in payment? That which he receives is from above himself, utterly out of his ability to create. It is from the heavens, while all that he could offer in return would be simply dust. If love means giving, it may be asked, how can man love God if there is nothing he can give him? God has provided for this by endowing man with the consciousness of individuality, independence, and will, and then he asks man to give up all these great powers for love of him. He says, Son, give me thine heart which is asking him for his life. This is the great lesson of the cross. Christ taught man that oneness with God meant utter loss of the human life. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. For God gives to this brave loser another life which fadeth not away, an eternal life. If, through obedience to the commands of God, he becomes able to taste one drop of the love of God in his being. He becomes evanescent in that melting love. He gives all that he has, is, or hopes to be, gives himself without a thought of reward. This giving is in obedience to the command of God, as expressed through Baha'u'llah. O son of humanity, if thou lovest me, turn away from thyself. If my will thou seekest, regard not thine own, that thou mayest die in me, and I live in thee. Particular love, or a special love for an individual, is not universal love, which is no respecter of persons. As the town is greater than the citizen, the state of more importance than the town, the country than the state, 
and mankind more than all, so the love of mankind is immeasurably above affection for one person or an immediate circle of friends. The love of the individual has, at its best, elements of selfishness in it. It seeks a response, or it may be only a pleasurable emotion caused by interest or nearness. But the love of mankind is an affection for the welfare and highest good of each one and of all, recognizing that all are children of one father and brothers of one family. It may cause but little emotion, but it demands service. Each member of humanity becomes a type of the whole, and love, that is service, goes out unsparingly to all without regard to kinship or recompense. If there be any preference, it is for the poor, the needy, the helpless, because the essence of love is to exalt the low and feed the hungry. Baha'u'llah has said, the most exalted word for harmony and love is, All are from God. This exalted word is like unto water, quenching the fire of animosity and rancor, hidden and deposited within hearts and breasts. Different religions will attain to the light of real union through this single word. Verily, he saith the truth, and guideth to the path. If one sees a poor creature who is repulsive, and he permits that word, all are from God, to enter his mind, the heart will soon respond, and repulsion will be overcome in the longing to help that poor one, to lift him up from his degradation to a perception of his divine birthright. Abdul Baha the true servant of God manifests this universal love in every word and act. Humanity, mankind, all of them are his beloved. He of all men can understand the lament of Christ. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Universal love is true humanity. The one universal lover is God, and as man approaches him, he becomes a reflector of that love, and becomes a lover of mankind. The word incarnate, the glory of God, Baha'u'llah said, Glory is not to him who loves his country, but to him who loves his kind. The first is manlike, the last is godlike. End of section 25. The Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase, section 26. The Baha'i Revelation is needed. Is there any religion of the past? that the whole world will accept. After 3,400 years of the Mosaic Law, 1,900 years of Christianity, and 1,300 years of Mohammedanism, it is as difficult to Christianize the world as to Moslemize it. If there were no further light than that which shines from the ordinary Christianity of today, how long will it require to bring the Mohammedan races alone to accept its teaching? Indeed, Mohammedanism is making more rapid strides among ignorant peoples than Christianity, but neither of them are affecting the other. Judaism, Buddhism, Brahmanism, Zoroastrianism are standing like great walls impervious to outside attacks though all showing signs of corruption and decadence within themselves. Why is it that the Christian word of God has not been accepted by all these peoples? A bit of history may give light on the matter. In 1820, Ramahan Roy 
the great indian reformer and founder of the brahmo samaj a man of high and noble character was so charmed with the teachings of jesus that he published extracts from them under the title precepts of jesus although born and trained a brahman he perceived clearly the awful practices that had been engrafted by the priests upon the original teachings and he strove to find for himself the pure truths of religion in his preface to the precepts of jesus he stated his belief and hope that those simple and clear expressions of moral laws would have effect in uplifting his people because they seemed to him the best expressions to be found in any religion of that which conduced to the real welfare of man and because he thought that they could not be made a ground for metaphysical criticism or dispute he made no references to the recorded miracles of jesus because as he said the indian mind was already sodden with miracles and could not be further affected by any relation of them this unique opportunity for the introduction of the teachings of christ among the brahmans was however rendered practically useless by the immediate and strong opposition of the christian missionaries then in india because he laid stress only upon the teachings of jesus as applicable to life and not upon the doctrines of the blood atonement and the miracles he was set upon denounced and ridiculed by the christians much to the delight of the brahmin priesthood later he succeeded in forming a sort of literary partnership with two christian missionaries for the purpose of translating the gospels into bengali for native use but when they came to the third verse of the first chapter of the gospel of st john and ramahan roy desired to translate the greek word dia to the bengali word meaning through both of the gentlemen refused to translate it except as in the old english translation by and one of them refused to assist further in that glorious work the original meaning of the phrase is through whom all things were made it is such an insistence upon partisan interpretations upon dogmas and doctrines rather than upon the life-helping power of the word that inspires ridicule and rejection by those who are called heathen it is written the faith of god and religion of god hath been revealed and manifested from the heaven of the will of the king of pre-existence only for the union and concord of the dwellers upon earth make it not a cause of discord and dissension baha'u'llah through the ages religion has been made a cause of discord and dissension the different religious teachings have separated the peoples more than differences in climate country or race and the same thing in each religion has been the cause of the division namely the idea held by each nation that its religion was the only one authorized by god and the conception growing out of that idea that it was the one people especially chosen by god to be his favorite he was ever deemed to be decidedly a respecter of persons this same idea reached down from the great religion to its several sects between whom the bitterness was most severe the mohammedan sunnites and shiites the christian catholics and protestants hated each other cordially even now a convocation of christian clergy looking toward a union of sects for service to humanity refuses to acknowledge unitarians or universalists as their brothers in association and service adherence to their self-chosen interpretations and opinions is of more value than the union of all possible earnest and noble workers for the uplifting of humanity but a few years ago within our memories each sect of christians claimed to control the only infallible path to heavenly safety they considered each other one to be at least doubtful if not indeed the very broad road to destruction the protestant still protests while the adherent to rome acknowledges no christians except the children of that church 
It is only when coming into light that we are able to recognize the darkness. And now, in this day of light, we see the gloom and chains of the spiritual prison houses in which mankind has been dwelling. We can also perceive that he who is incarcerated, barred in by walls of his own building, cannot extend the hand of assistance to the inmate of another prison. Nor can he reasonably expect to succeed in gathering others from their places of confinement into his own, or inducing them to break their bonds to put on his. But when the Deliverer appears, the messenger of God to open the prison doors, to break down the walls of separation, to bring light into their darkness, to lift them up into the liberty of divine manhood, to establish freedom, peace, harmony, and love, to reveal heavenly happiness and glory as the birthright of man, and to make this earth a paradise of God, who that seeks good and truth can refrain from looking to this glorious light of revelation and lifting up his heart and hands in praise to almighty god the father of generosity and love does the world need such an awakening such a spiritual sun rising and divine introduction to peace for answer we have but to look at the nations of the world and their conditions during the last century and now peering into the darkness of the past we perceive that all peoples have been dwelling in bondage religion which was given by god to develop and lift man up to that high estate where the truth should make him free has been used with craft and greed to shackle his soul with the great masses of mankind that captivity still exists but we see here and there in many directions efforts for freedom the conditions of the past no longer satisfy on every hand men are turning from their former teachers and doctrines breaking their bonds and looking to new guides the ground of dead dogmas is being ploughed deep to prepare for a new seed sowing the clouds of man-made doctrines are dispersing before the dawn of truth and the ranks of darkness are breaking before the armies of light had the commands of god spoken by the mouth of our lord jesus been obeyed there would have been no need for another revelation of the same teachings but as soon as the pure seed of the word sown by him matthew thirteen twenty seven began to spring up tares appeared with it men interpreted the words of god according to their own material imaginations mingled pagan philosophies and false conceptions with the pure teachings and proclaimed the whole as divine doctrine this was easily done as there were no actual writings of jesus to correct them to each great teaching was added a material interpretation which gradually robbed it of its spiritual instruction and changed the laws of freedom given for the liberation of god's people from the bonds of jewish and pagan theocracies into new theological prisons for the souls of men two peter two nineteen and so the wheat and tares have grown up together lest the wheat be also rooted up until the harvest the end of the world or age when the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear were it not for the tares of false doctrines the word of god would have conquered the world centuries ago the world is better than it knows it is those tares which it refuses to accept and which hinder the great nations from receiving the truth of jesus so simply and beautifully declared by him and now god's loving kindness to his creation has again appeared in new instruction and command such that all wayfarers in the path of god may not err therein 
the human instrument is needed for the revealing of his will and guidance the infinite god does not flame forth his brightness directly to finite man to blind and destroy him but tempers it to man's condition a pure instrument is needed one that is selfless strong to bear all indignities weak in self strong in god a teacher is required for his children when his lessons become an old story and without effect because of man's adulteration mercy sends a new teacher who is a mediator a lamp to convey and express as much of the divine light as can be born it is always darkest before dawn he comes when the world is plunged in ignorance and uncertainty and brings the light of knowledge and assurance that mankind may be saved from self-destruction today this is baha'u'llah the glory of god the bearer of light end of section 26 the baha'i revelation by thornton chase section 27 the object of the baha'i revelation is unity it is to dispel the differences between religions to overcome strife to create the unity of mankind in the recognition of god's oneness and singleness and to bring peace among all peoples and men as members of the one human family of the great father and creator of all it is written o people of the world ye are the fruit of one tree and the leaves of one branch walk with perfect charity concord affection and agreement i declare by the sun of truth the light of agreement shall brighten and illumine all horizons baha'u'llah we know that each great religion had its beginning in one source the word of god revealed by his messenger that all taught the same truths of reverence and love to god and justice to man we find the golden rule inculcated in each religion and as early as five thousand four hundred years ago three thousand five hundred years before the time of christ religion is one always was one its pearl of truth was love and its duties the qualities of love but man changed and colored it to suit his desires changed its god love into self-love its divine attainments to earthly ambitions he set up an interpretation of his own placed a ring of exclusion about it and made it a fortress of offense against all outside of his circle each of the great religions of god has taught that a time of consummation should come when there would be a great and universal revelation when all the world should know the word of god would worship him and dwell together in peace but each religious nation construed that to mean that the great coming would be through the return of its own prophet and founder who would then appear with such mighty powers and angel hosts that he would force all nations to acknowledge him and bow before the rule of that one special and chosen people alas for the pride and vanity of man that which he hopes is impossible and contrary to the essence of god's teaching the prophecies of god are sure and true but man's interpretation of them is from his own wish and ignorance who hath declared this from ancient time who hath told it from that time have not i the lord and there is no god else beside me a just god and a savior there is none beside me look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for i am god and there is none else 
I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified, and shall glory. Isaiah 45, 21 The time has come. That great revelation, the Word, has gone out to all the nations. But instead of holding up to the gaze of the world one religion as perfect, admirable, and to be embraced, it declares every religion to be of the one God, all pure in their origin, one in their essence, and that each has gone astray and lost much of its truth as originally revealed. It points all men back to the teachings of their own prophet and shows the oneness of those instructions. It calls upon all mankind to thus learn the primary doctrine of the oneness of God the Father, the oneness of His Word, the oneness of His prophets, the revealers of that Word, the oneness of religion, and the oneness of the human race, His children. The adherents of each religion of the past have demanded that all men should accept it or be lost. This revelation of God's will calls upon the followers of each religion to acknowledge the divinity and truth in the others, and for all to unite in love, peace, and worship of the one God and Father of all. O children of men, do ye know why we have created ye from one clay? that no one should glorify himself over the other. Be ye ever mindful of how ye were created. Since we created ye all from one substance, ye must be as one soul, walking with the same feet, eating with one mouth, and living in one land, that ye may manifest with your being and by your deeds and actions the signs of unity and the spirit of oneness. Arabic Hidden Words 64 O son of man, my oneness is my design. I have designed it for thee, therefore clothe thyself with it. Thus thou mayest be a star of my omnipresence forever. Arabic Hidden Words 65 the central Baha'i teaching is the oneness and singleness of God, the infinite entity who is above ascent or descent, and who singly and alone abideth in his own place, which is holy above space and time, mention and utterance, sign, description and definition, height and depth. This unique one manifests through existence his oneness, which, in its true significance, means that God alone should be realized as the one power which animates and dominates all things, which are but manifestations of its energy. Baha'u'llah Thus all things are manifestations according to their degrees of the oneness of God, and all are in unity, harmony, and perfection, each in its own especial kingdom of the universe, excepting man who has been given the power to oppose the law of oneness and to injure himself by using his will contrary to the will of oneness. This gift enables him to ascend or descend in the scale of being. Were it not for this free ability, he could never ascend, because that signifies a change of condition amounting to a recreation, and it depends upon his compliance with certain laws. It is a growth from one plane of existence to another. To attain this change, new faculties, 
new powers must be created in him and he can be fitted to receive them only through a free personal choice and personal activity in compliance with instructions given by god through his revealed word these powers and this elevation into the kingdom of god are divine gifts coming from the love and generosity of god but they will not be forced upon him who turns his back upon them the path of heedlessness and self-will is choked with thorns of suffering loss degradation and death that man may be pricked to consciousness and desire for better things it is the way of selfness separation disagreement and disunity the path of ascent is that of unity recognition of responsibility of god's love power right justice mercy generosity imminence oneness it is fragrant with flowers of true friendship love and peace and it leads to eternal life the revelation of god's word today invites the wanderers and prodigals to return to this way of unity which leads to their father's house end of section 27 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 28 the bahai revelation makes all things new thou sendest forth thy spirit they are created and thou renewest the face of the earth the glory of the lord shall endure forever psalms 104 30 the revealed word of god is his creative power through it were all things made that were made it creates new men renews right spirits and makes clean hearts its first command uttered to the chaos of man's restless indefinite uncentered life is let there be light the word is that light and its divine power pierces the veils of selfness penetrates the centers of being and kindles a flame of love which melts away the barriers of separation and opens the spirit of man to the spirit of god o son of light forget all save me and be comforted by my spirit arabic hidden words 17 o my friend thou art the son of the heaven of my holiness defile not thyself with the eclipse of the world persian hidden words 73 o son of man lift up thy heart with delight that thou mayest be fitted to meet me and to mirror forth my beauty arabic hidden words 37 when the light of that holy spirit shines forth from the heart of man all the beasts of darkness the doubt suspicion distrust unbelief fear and sadness flee away and assurance certainty trust confidence joy and peace take possession of the new-born creature the new created son of god this work of creation has ever been the purpose of the divine revelation from the beginning of the world of mankind in each beginning of a new dispensation of god's kingdom on earth and in the beginning of each human soul's redemption from ignorance and death to knowledge love and life the revelation of god's will brings the dawn of a new day of truth to disperse the night of error and discontent today it shines forth in glorious splendor so that the minds and hearts of all people are awakening to renewed energy to new perceptions and longings nature under this wonderful light 
is opening her long-locked treasures to scientific search and giving the world the means of an immense progression toward better conditions of life it is a day of wonderful revealing the whole earth is flooded in the light of the spirit it enters every mind that has reflective power and radiates in every plane of being it is unfolding new things everywhere the scientist discovers new laws and facts the artist beholds new beauties the physician uses new methods the student learns new lessons the philosopher conceives new ideas the aspirant forms new ideals never before has earth witnessed such a disclosure of its secrets in this clear spiritual atmosphere everything reveals the laws and lessons of god evidencing that one power which animates and dominates all things which are but manifestations of its energy the apex focus and center of all this manifestation is the word of god which in this day of light shines forth as the glory of god baha'u'llah through his human instrument his image baha'u'llah this word is the messenger of his instruction his command and invitation to the souls of men it is the brilliant sun the focal dynamo of the holy spirit and the new knowledges of men whether material mental moral ethical or spiritual are around it as planets about their sun they are all parts of a new created heavenly system the new heaven and earth of which the shining word is the center the light giver man's discoveries are his perceptions of truths in the realms of existence which become visible to him in the light of the spirit while the revelation of the word of god is the sun of truth itself shining into the minds and hearts and creating in them the powers of true perception this is the revealing of god to men that the seeking of men for god the sun has brought the new day though many earnest workers in the world may not yet see the real sun shining in the new heavens yet they should know that it is day because the light is here even those who ascribe their new knowledges and progress to their own greatness must acknowledge that their success was invisible until the light shone forth the new things were hidden non-existent to them until the sun of this manifestation dawned on the eastern horizon the eye of the blind cannot see until it be opened and even then it can see but dimly until there be light he said and what he said is truth the root of all knowledge is the knowledge of god glory be to him and this knowledge is impossible save through his manifestation let us lay our pride and self-praise at his feet and give glory to god for all that we have all that we are or shall be unity wisdom peace justice mercy and love the elements of heaven on earth can be realized only through that creative power which makes all things new by recreating the hearts of men all agreements of nations cannot bring peace until they be made in the fear of the lord in knowledge of his word and obedience to his commands naught but the changeless power of that word can give permanent welfare to man the sooner this is recognized the sooner shall appear the millennial heaven on earth
the time for reception of this heaven-bringing knowledge has come old doctrines and beliefs are being tested in the courts of modern judgment for this is the day of judgment and the chaff of false teachings is being cast into the fires of ridicule and rejection on the one side are scholarly efforts to destroy both wheat and tares together to make way for new material philosophies on the other are anxious hearts looking for the truth of the eternal god and lifting their eyes to the hills to behold the coming of their helper and their lord there must be decomposition before a new composition the old conditions must be disrupted and dissolved before the new can be established and so the world is in a tumult of unrest it is only the process of preparation the cyclone which purifies the air and out of its struggles and uncertainties shall come the peace of nations and to the individual hearts the peace that passeth understanding through all the storm and stress the son of god's revealed word baha'u'llah shines steadily piercing the clouds its light of knowledge and heat of love shall disperse them entirely in god's good time and all the world shall acknowledge its creator and declare he is god and there is no god but him he doeth what he willeth praise be to his holy name o son of man lift up thy head from slumber for the sun hath climbed to the zenith that he may illumine thee with the lights of beauty arabic hidden words sixty three o son of man the light hath shone upon thee from the horizon of the mount and the spirit of purity hath breathed in the sinai of thy heart therefore empty thyself of doubts and fancies then enter into this mansion that thou mayest be prepared for the eternal life and ready to meet me herein there is no death no trouble nor burden arabic hidden words 64 end of section 28 the bahai revelation by thornton chase section 29 the revelation is complete in itself were all the books of former days lost and forgotten the whole of true religious teaching would be found in the words of the Baha'i Revelation. It contains all that is needed for instruction and highest attainment, the salvation of all races and peoples. The essence of all sacred teaching is expressed in it. It is the renaissance of all religions and for the true believers in each religion. Each finds in it the essence and culmination of itself each acceptor recognizes it as the flower and beauty of his own religion each rejecter denies it to have any relation to his own the muslim calls it christianity the christian opposer calls it mohammedanism while those of every religion who receive it call every man friend and brother the first of its hidden words is as follows this is that which hath descended from the source of majesty through the tongue of power and strength upon the prophets of the past we have taken its essences and clothed them with the garment of brevity as a favor to the beloved that they may fulfill the covenant of god that they may perform in themselves that which he hath entrusted to them and attain the victory by virtue of devotion in the land of the spirit the revelations of the past are still of vital value to their followers and for the identification of the essential oneness of god's word in all times then as now 
for with him a thousand years are as a day in every scripture is sufficient for man's salvation if he wills for it if he hungers for righteousness and thirsts for the waters of life but darkness has covered the earth and gross darkness the people and but little faith is found upon earth now again the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined again it has come to the land of zebulun and naphtali by the way of the sea in galilee of the nations isaiah nine one to two matthew four fourteen to sixteen since the time of the crusaders the shore road leading from haifa to akka and thence on to damascus in the interior has been called the via maris the way of the sea whoever has gone the nine miles from mount carmel to akka riding in the surf along the mediterranean shore will recognize the fitness of that name the way of the sea by that way was the exile baha'u'llah sent to his long imprisonment at akka god made the wrath of man to praise him and to accomplish his prophecies by sending his light bearer to that land which he had chosen throughout the ages for affliction and for the revealing of his glory from that greatest prison he announced the word of god with such power that it passed through the bars of stone through the walled and guarded fortress to distant countries even to the thrones of kings it penetrated the hearts of seekers for truth everywhere and the victory it proclaimed from the prison room which seemed a mockery of truth has resounded from the lips and lives of the redeemed in many lands no wall no guard no prison could prevent that word or hinder its effect today it is going on from victory to victory while all the powers of nature and devices of men are working together in the hand of god to establish the new heavens and the new earth to prepare the way for the universal knowledge of god and that most great peace which he has declared must accompany his kingdom on earth the last of the hidden words proclaims the completeness of this revelation i testify o friends that the bounty has become complete the evidence is accomplished the argument manifested and the reason affirmed now what will your endeavors show forth from the degrees of devotion thus are the favors perfected unto ye and unto all who are in the heavens and earths praise be unto god the lord of all mankind end of section twenty nine the Baha'i Revelation by Thornton Chase, Section 30 Tablet from Abdul Baha O people, the doors of the kingdom are opened. The sun of truth is shining upon the world. The fountains of life are flowing. The day springs of mercy have appeared the greatest and most glorious light is now manifest to illumine the hearts of men awake and hear the voice of god calling from all parts of the supreme world come unto me o ye children of men come unto me o ye who are thirsty and drink of this sweet water which is descending in torrents upon all parts of the globe now is the time now is the accepted time look ye at the time of christ had the people realized that the holy spirit was speaking to them through his divine mouth 
they would not have waited three centuries before accepting him and now is it meet for you that you are sleeping upon the beds of idleness and neglect while the father declared of christ has come among us and opened the greatest door of bounteous gifts and divine favors let us not be like those in past centuries who were deaf to his call and blind to his beauty but let us try and open our eyes that we may see him and open our ears that we may hear him and cleanse our hearts that he may come in and abide in our temples these days are the days of faith and deeds not the days of words and lip service let us arise from the sleep of negligence and realize what a great feast is prepared for us first eating thereof ourselves then giving to others who are thirsty for the water of knowledge and hungering for the bread of life these great days are swiftly passing and once gone they can never be recalled so while the rays of the sun are still shining and the center of the covenant of god is manifest let us go forth to work for after a while the night will come and the way to the vineyard will not then be so easy to find the light of knowledge hath appeared before which the darkness of every superstitious fancy shall be annihilated the hosts of the supreme concourse are descending to assist all those who rise up to serve their lord to subdue and gain the victory over the city of the hearts to proclaim the glad tidings of the coming of god and to unite the souls of his creatures commune o god i see that the manifestations of thy providence have indeed attracted me and the pure wine of thy utterance hath taken possession of me from all directions in such wise that i could not see anything save that which makes me acknowledge and remember thy signs thy manifestations and thy affairs by thy glory every glance of my eye whenever directed toward thy heaven reminds me of thy greatness exaltation highness and superiority whenever i look to the earth it makes me acquainted with the manifestations of thy might and the appearance of thy grace whenever i gaze toward the sea it speaks of thy greatness might authority and loftiness whenever i turn to the mountains they show me the standards of thy victory and the banners of thy power by thy glory o thou in whose grasp are the reins of the world and the control of nations i was overtaken by the warmth of thy love and the exhilaration of the wine of thy unity to such an extent that made me hear from the blowing of the wind thy mention and praise from the murmuring of waters thy qualifications and attributes and from the rustling of trees the mysteries of thy judgment which thou hast deposited in thy kingdom praise be to thee o god of names and creator of heaven praise be to thee for that by reason of which thou hast made known to thy servants thy day wherein the stream calther of life hath flowed from the finger of thy generosity and the spring of revelation and unity hath become manifest through thy manifestation to whomsoever is in thy earth and heaven o god this is a day the light of which thou hast made holy above the sun and its effulgence i testify this that th thy manna day has been illumined by the light of thy face and by the effulgence of the dawning light and station 
this is a day wherein every despondent one hath clad himself with the mantle of hope every sick one adorned himself with the garments of healing and every poor one came nigh to the sea of richness praise be to thee o desired of the world praise be to thee o beloved of the hearts of the yearning baha'u'llah end of section thirty